Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Thursday afternoon, just before Friday, Monday morning podcast, and I'm just checking in on you. How are you? How's your Thursday going, man? Um, oh, fucking stupid me, man. I was all clean. I wasn't fucking doing anything. Then I go to Vegas. I start eating like shit. I smoke a cigar. Now I got to start all over again. It's not fucking believable. So I'm back cleaned up. You know, but it's good though, because usually when I fuck up like that, then it takes me another three months to get the momentum to be like, all right, no cigars, stay away from the coffee, don't eat any weed gummies. Now it's just been more like four days. It's just like, all right, am I really going to fucking do this? I don't want to do this. All right, let's get back to the gym. Let's do the things we need to do. Let's fill up the time that we spent hurting ourselves with different activities that will build for a better future. So I've been playing a lot of drums instead of fucking sitting around smoking cigars, right? So um, I sat down yesterday, and it finally fucking happened. I I was able to play along to uh, Led Zeppelin's Good Times, Bad Times, one bass drum, playing those fucking triplets. Now, I might go down there today, you know, giving a shit too much, legs a little tighter foot or whatever and then it doesn't fucking happen but it did happen yesterday it finally happened ladies and gentlemen and all the ships would say my dad drumming went to the next level I'm actually jamming with some buddies of mine when I go back to um, uh, Boston next month well back east the family back east I go back east and um, when I get up to Massachusetts a few days before the Fenway gig. Um, I'm going to be jamming with uh, a couple buddies of mine from back in the high school days. And they pick, you know, some easy songs or whatever. And one of them, ACDC, TNT. This guy's just some tricky shit in there. It's like, all right, I can play that. It's easy. I can play this one. Oh, my God, if you saw this fucking set list, dude. I mean, it is... It is uh, I don't think anything is like post 1985 <laughs> one of the songs I don't think I've heard it since it came out do you remember that song by Kiss Tears Are Falling oh no tears are falling just sort of a throwaway you know it's one of those songs that it did well on. I remember on the countdown but like it never really got much radio play after probably because it was a zillion songs being put out by bands like that back then. And I have not heard that fucking song since then. I was like, holy shit. All right. We'll check this one out, man. So anyway, I'm fucking psyched. It finally happened. Um, I just been doing that um, triplet exercises, those triplet licks, triplet licks and not doing the actual playing the good times, bad times thing because I just felt like that just got in my head. It was just this frustrating thing. I'd always get almost to the top of the hill and then fucking slide back down because I'd get busy or whatever. So, uh, yeah, so that happened. And then yesterday I flew a Robinson R44 for the first time in like almost two years, coming up on two years. And ho- I didn't remember anything. Couldn't remember how to start it up. Um, the main rotor turns the other way. So all your feet inputs were, were the opposite. Um, I can't even explain how fucked up that is because the top half of your body is the same. And then, then the bottom half, the, the inputs go differently. Oh, you basically do. Sorry. I'm recording this literally right as I got up, uh, was hanging with the kids last night and did not record the podcast. Um, all it is, is you're, you're, you know, with the one I have, my left foot follows the collective. When I follow the Robinson, which turns, uh, what is that, counterclockwise? I think the, I don't know. the collective follows the right foot. So like when I picked it up, you know, I was just like, all right, just pay attention to the nose. But I was still a little cockeyed, and I was a little high when I was taxiing. But other than that, it was cool. I was actually uh, hanging out with some friends of mine, and it made me, uh, you know, I was thinking like, ah, man, I could have got one of these. 
It's a little four-seater, but the main rotor blades are bigger and it's faster. It has a V6 engine. But uh, I actually, by the end of the flight, I was really happy I got the Cabri. You can't even compare the two. As far as just like safety, uh, the avionics that's in the Cabri, it's a full glass cockpit. And I can, I have all the, I can just hit a button that says traffic and I see anybody who's near me or whatever like that. And, and this was going back to like the analog shit. And I was just like, uh, I don't like this. <laughs> I don't, I do not fucking feel as safe. So, um, I'm also, uh, I'm getting rid of a bunch of shit. Like I have too many guitars and I only play like, like three of them. And even then I play drums most of the time. So I have these other ones that I'm going to be selling. Dean Del Rey is going to sell them for me. Um, three guitars that I'm going to sell. And then I have, and then I have three and I don't fucking think I need any more than that. And then I can kind of keep them all in the same place as opposed to having guitar cases all over the place. Like I'm fucking Keith Richards. I got a little crazy, you know, I was playing guitar. I was having fun. I'm like, well, I want to get this guitar. I want to have that guitar. I want to have this guitar. It's just like, then I had kids and then it's like, I got to hide these guitars. The kids are going to put their hands on them. They're going to fuck the guitars up. And then they sit out here. Then my fucking air conditioning broke. And so I'm like, well, I can't fucking have my, you know, because the air conditioner's busted. I got to fucking, you know, stick them in the garage. Then they're in the fucking garage. And the spider's like, ah, fucking sell them. So that's what's happening. Um, and I got a bunch of shit people have given to me over the years, you know, on the road of which I'm looking at right now. And I just going to fucking autograph the shit. And next time we have a uh, a benefit um, at all things comedy, I'm just gonna fucking donate all that stuff. And Josh Adam Meyer show, shimmy shimmy ya, yeah, we give shit away. I'm fucking get rid of a bunch of stuff. Do you know I'm still fucking dealing with that goddamn shop vac that I bought? So I ended up going down to Home Depot to fucking exchange it. For those of you who haven't listened to the podcast, I went down to get this fucking shop vac. You know. So I can keep my garage clean. I fucking hate this shit coming out here and there's all kinds of crap. There's just no seal under the doors. The garage door and the, and the side door, right? So I get shit all over the place here and it fucking drives me nuts. I don't like it. I like, I like a nice, clean garage that has cars in it. That's my fucking, and a little podcast studio. That's what I like. I fucking hate people who, who use their fucking garage as a storage unit. You know, or they just convert it to more s- square footage for their house. They turn the, the entire thing into some sort of man cave or some shit. I fucking hate that shit. You know, I don't, I don't, I and mean, it's my stupid thing. I just look at it as like, great. Now, now you have to have, now you have to go buy more shit to decorate that. Now you need another sofa, couch, Davenport, whatever your age is, whatever the fuck you call it. Get your feet off the Davenport. That was my grandfather. Um, anyway, um, that's just one of those things that fucking drives me up the wall. You know, like that there's this movement on the internet where people are annoyed by people that back into parking spots. Like this is the most egregious thing you could ever fucking do. It's like, it isn't. It's a brilliant thing to do. You back in and you've, you've clearly made your statement that wherever you're about ready to go, you don't want to be there. Or you want to get the fuck out of there. You're putting that energy out to the universe. If it's a social situation, people see it. It's fantastic. So I guess my version of that is if you don't fucking put your car in the garage, I think you're an asshole. (laughs) Uh, Get your goddamn feet off of that fucking Davenport. You didn't talk like that. Davenport. Those are all those words that went away, huh? Davenport. Remember dungarees instead of jeans? Work boots, boondockers. He had on his dungarees and boondockers and Christ, he goes over and he puts them right on the fucking Davenport. Um, are you from America? Um, anyway. Uh, oh, I went to the All-Star game. I heard they had every player fucking mic'd up too, which is my dream scenario. 
in any sporting event is that all the athletes are mic'd up. Even if they're joking around, it's cool. But, I, you know, if they were actually fucking pissed at each other, you can hear what, the, what they're saying, talking all kinds of shit. Um, you know, but obviously you can't have that because kids are watching and that type of thing. But I've always said that you could have like an opposite channel, the R-rated channel. Then you know what would happen. If the feed would accidentally go to the clean channel and someone would be arguing a call saying every you know word in the book probably wouldn't be a good thing. What do you think, Bill? Are you going to go out on a limb right there and say that, that that wouldn't be a good thing? Yes, I am. Um, so we ended up going there and uh, I got hooked up with some tickets by Bet MG, M- MGM hooked us up. Thank you for the tickets. Unfortunately, it was hot as fucking balls. And where we were sitting, we were in the uh, the upper deck, the Bob Euchre seats along the first baseline. And the way the sun goes down is that part of the bleachers is facing west. So the sun is just in your fucking face the whole time. So uh, I went with like three other dudes, right? So two of them went to go get the beer and the food. Me and my other buddy sit down. And we sit, and we're literally like one row in front of the shade. But the shade's going away anyway because the sun's going down. It's just basically going to kill everybody in that section. And we were just sitting there for like two seconds, and he literally just looks at me. He's like, you know, you know, we could go down there and help help them out with the food because <laughs> he's a nice guy and didn't want to say these these seats are going to be brutal. And I just started laughing. He's like, no, these are fine. These are fine. We, we got the car service. He was already talking about the car service before the fucking game even started. So we ended up going down. And um, I don't know if because of the All-Star game, there seemed to be very few ushers working. And we ended up finally finding somebody and figuring out, you know, where the Dodgers pro shop was to buy some stuff. I got uh, the American League All-Star jersey for myself and for my daughter. And... Uh, I was standing in line. I couldn't find the one that said Boston on it. And my buddy's like, I'm thinking I need a large. My brother, my buddy was like, what do you want? A meeting? Medium? And I said, yeah. Knowing that I needed a large, probably needed a large. I held it up and I thought it looked all right. Then I came home and I mean, I fit in it, but it was a tight jersey. You can't walk around in a tight baseball jersey. <laughs> you ever go to a hockey game and you see some guy wearing a fucking jersey that used to hang like, you know. Like you could put pads underneath it. Now it's like fucking skin tight. Looks like he's ready to go ride a, a fucking time trial on a bicycle. Yeah, I can't have that. So I'm going to give it to somebody else. Um, but anyway, we ended up standing on the sixth deck looking down at uh, at the game and just cracking up and having a good time. And uh, <laughs> this guy came up and he saw me and then my buddy's an actor, right? And he's fucking looking at us. He's like, oh my God, what's going on? I like your comedy. Oh my God, I love that TV show or the movie that you did, blah, blah. Then he just looks at us and he goes, what are you guys doing way up here? <laughs> and all my friends just started fucking laughing at me because they were busting my balls about where we were sitting. Um, I didn't mind the seats. I actually, I mean, it just was the heat. The seats were fine. So I'm not shitting on Bet MGM. I, I really appreciate the tickets. And also it took me back the first time I ever went to that stadium was in the mid-90s. I went to a, a night game, thank Christ. And uh, I remember it was right when Mike Piazza, you know, he'd already just started to make a name for himself that he was, you know, the star of the Dodgers and a star across the league. So that was pretty fucking cool. Um but anyway, we ended up having a blast, and, I, and I, I was talking to them the next day. They were like, it was actually kind of fucking cool because we ended up walking all around the stadium. We just did standing room, just staying in the shade. And uh, we were up by home plate. We saw Kershaw come out. And uh, oh, that Otani kid, he f- called it. He goes, what, what are you looking forward to most? He goes, first pitch, first swing. And then he goes up there against Kershaw. First pitch, he takes the first swing, and he just fucking lays it right up the middle for a base hit. And we were like, oh, shit. Did he say first swing, first hit? Did he say I was going to, you know, we were thinking, no, I was like, no, 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 no. He said uh, first pitch, first swing, something like that. 
And uh, we were all bummed that they wouldn't let him pitch. But um, anyway, so then the next person Kershaw faced was Aaron Judge. So so it was just like, wow, let's see what happens here. And uh, he ends up doing some veteran move. Just getting Otani leaning the wrong way, steps off the rubber over to first, fucking picks him off, and then strikes out Aaron Judge. We were like, all right, that was fucking sick. <laughs> um, I just wish I got to go back and watch the game because I want to hear I want to hear them be all mic'd up. And then we ended up later on. We ended up all the way out in. Uh, where did we go? We went to uh, we watched along the third baseline for a little bit, then the first baseline, and then we ended up all the way out in the outfield. And that was a good time. There's always great people out there. So, uh, you know, we ended up, (laughs) we ended up out there and uh, there was a bunch of people from the armed services were there. And we were talking about like the sailor's uniform that they have, how like Broadway shows have like ruined that uniform. Well, like you see like the Marine uniform, you know, the Army uniform, you know, the dress, whatever. But like you see like the Navy one, you just think five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> um, it's wrong. What they need to do is they need to do another movie. Because I got to be honest with you, out of all the war movies that scare the shit out of me the most, it's the Navy ones. And that is the last branch that I would fucking join. There's no fucking way I would join the Navy because I don't want to be on a ship that sinks and you end up in the fucking water and now you're in Quint's fucking story from Jaws. Um, I know the odds of that now. But, you know, I talk to guys, you know, I, I meet people in the armed services and I talk to these guys in the fucking Navy and they talk about people falling overboard and not being able to find them. I just cannot fucking believe that just the terror and the loneliness of that death just sitting there in the middle of the fucking ocean they can't find you they probably turn the fucking thing around to look for you you can see them they can't see or hear you and then you see when they quit they fucking (laughs) sail away or some shit you probably die of hypothermia then god willing god willing you die of fucking hypothermia you're not just hanging there Waiting for a fucking shark to come along. To hell with that. Um, then you got to think, who really has a good Navy anymore? Did you guys watch that? Cry of the Wolf? Le Chant de Lou. The French movie? That was another one. You know, submarines and all of that stuff. My God. We got to run quietly and they're waiting for the death charge to go off. Fuck all of that, man. Fuck all of that. If I joined the armed services, before I went in, I would learn how to build websites, and that I would request that duty. <laughs> I can help with recruitment, sir. Um, just don't have me in the fucking sun, please, for the love of God, and I don't want to be out on the water, all right? I don't want to be on land or on water. I want to be in an office. Those are my requirements for my service to my country. Um, oh, speaking of that, I have an idea, man. I don't know why this hasn't been filled yet. You know, there's a restaurant called Hooters. Okay? And, you know, they sell food, and then the chicks walk around with, like, titties, some real, some fake, kind of like they're chicken, right? <laughs> it's, it's mostly chicken. I have no idea what it is. Um, I was thinking like, you know, nobody gives a fuck about tits anymore. People finally came around to what I always knew. It was always about the ass, right? So why don't you fucking have ass hooters, right? You call it cakes and you do the same thing. It's like McDowell's, but you just do it. You have have a restaurant. It's called cakes and it's only, only real asses. Real ass bitches need to apply. No, real... Only real asses, not the fake ones. You know, where you walk and the ass doesn't move? None of that shit, right? And you serve the same level of mediocre chicken, and then I think that you kind of undercut Hooters. You call it cakes. 
you know? And then just to keep the feminists at bay, you actually have uh, an array of cakes that you can have for dessert. (laughs) No, it has nothing to do with us exploiting, uh, uh, turning our wait staff into sex objects. It has to do with our dessert menu. And I'd appreciate it if you get your mind out of the gutter and maybe take a look at the menu first next time before you come over here and insult me and everybody else here, all the other fine people here over here at Cakes. <laughs> Hooters and Cakes. It's like Turks and Caicos, right? Except the restaurant version of it. Oh, that's what you do. You partner up with a Turkish restaurant chain, if there is such a thing. You call it Turks and Cakes. Oh, uh, whatever. I'm just brainstorming here, people. But it would fucking work, I think. I think it would work. And then you could say how progressive you were because of all the minority hires that you would have. Obviously, if you were trying to corner the market on asses, you know, those would be a lot of minority hires. (laughs) Was it the fact that you were actually woke or was it just that's what the market was? One of those 60-minute interviews. I mean, you're dodging everything. You're, we're, we're really supposed to believe you, that you called the restaurant cakes because of your dessert menu. I mean, look at this. Look at these photos. Look at this. There's not one woman facing the camera. And there you are. You're twice the age of everybody there. You know, I don't think I like what you're suggesting. Suggesting. I'm suggesting it, sir. This is, in your, this is a picture on the, on the front cover of your menu at Cakes. Oh, that that was my wife's idea. Um, Anyway, sorry. That was the the 60-minute saga of cakes. Turks and Caicos. Um, Sorry. Anyways, Major League Baseball's coming back. Fucking bummed out, man. You know, why do they need to announce that the Red Sox are sort of, this is a rebuilding year? Why do they need to do that? I mean, you could have waited till August. As long as you know, you're running the team. So what the fuck do I need to know for? Can I just sit there in ignorant bliss going like, maybe Sales Finger will <laughs> will heal? Jesus Christ, that fucking guy. He's had everything but a piano fall on him. Um, oh, whatever. It is what it is. I'm still going to watch him. Just what else am I going to do? It's still f- five and a half weeks. Dude, let's look up. When does the NFL season start? This is this is the question that you ask when the owner of your team says that it's now a rebuilding year. Um, I'm still going to ride with them through the dog days of August, man. Uh, let's see. Oh, what about the Houston Astros just getting mercilessly booed at the All Star Game? Jesus Christ! I thought Dodger fans had a lot of fucking balls booing the Houston Astros. You know, okay, they went to Home Depot. They bought a trash can. What did you guys do? You went around the league and bought every fucking star in the universe and have close to a $300 million payroll. Come on. What are we doing here? People on the Dodgers tested positive for fucking steroids too. We're, We're all doing something. Let's not just pick on Houston because they're consistently voted one of the fattest cities in the United States, you know? And you feel a little extra confident because you know they can't catch you carrying all that weight. I'll tell you what would do great down in Houston. A little restaurant called Cakes. Huh? Oh, my God. That'd be hard to fucking hire women down there. I thought it was called Cakes. Yeah, but it's like an in-shape. You know, we want in-shape booties. You just have a fat ass, okay? There's a difference. I'm going to report you to the Restaurant Better Business Bureau. Okay, you do that. You do that. And we'll get him drunk here. We'll get him some dessert and have a few of these chicks sit in his lap. And that whole problem's going to go away. Because this is Texas, man. All right? You can still do shit like that. I'm fucking with you. All right. Sorry, I'm looking this up. NFL first, first game. It is Thursday, September 8th. Fuck. All right, let's let's change the question. Excuse me, 
Ah, you fucking cunt. I swear to God. What is with this search thing where the whole thing then just selects? What's the deal with every... Not MLB, you idiot. NCAA. Don't they start a week earlier? Search. What we got. What we got. What we got. Can't they... Do, I don't... They, Hey, robot in my phone, what's the uh, first, what's the date of the first NCAA football game this year? Saturday, August 27th. All right. And today's what? The 21st. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha. We're only about five weeks out. Woo. And did I hear that they realigned? Is that something that I heard? That UCLA and USC are not in the Pac-10 anymore? Let me see this. Maybe, yeah, I should do this voice thing, huh? Right? Hello, robot person. This is your owner, Bill Burr. I want to learn about NCAA realignment. This is the fucking worst question ever. I'm not sure I understand. I'm right there with you, buddy. NCAA realignment. What's the deal? I like to challenge it. (laughs) Devon Deal. Deal from which team? All right. NCAA realignment. Which sport? Football, you fucking assholes. Oh, the little pie thing's spinning. All it's doing is just giving me schedules. What the fuck's that Florida team with the goddamn prehistoric snake on the side of its helmet? That's not... Okay. I don't know. I don't know what... I don't know what you just sent. This doesn't help me. Anyway, I just know I I got a text from somebody who goes, Well, kiss the Pac-10, Pac-12 goodbye. And I was like, what does that mean? It's like fucking realignment. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know. All right. We have a read here, everyone. Uh, Helix. Helix? You know, sleep is important. Everything from your immune system to your metabolism. Make sure you're getting the best night's sleep you can. Helix Sleep has a quick quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress that you know will be perfect for the way you sleep. Everybody's unique. And Helix knows that, knows that, so they have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, and firm mattresses, just like the tires in racing. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot, you sweaty bastard. Mattress, mattresses, mattresses, great for spinal alignment to prevent morning aches and pains. Mattresses for people who sleep on their stomach and wake up with morning wood. Mattresses for people who shit the bed. Sorry. Um, Helix is awesome, but you know, you don't need to take my word for it. He bulletproof mattresses. For liberals who don't have a gun in the house. Uh, It was awarded the number one overall mattress pick of 2020 uh, by GQ and Wired Magazine. It's so amazing that they have a magazine about doing blow. Helix has been recommended by multiple leading chiropractor doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solo- solution, solution, solution for improving sleep. Just go to helixsleep.com slash burr. Take their two-minute quiz, sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress. Mattresses for people that take mattress quizzes that will keep, give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out. For a hundred nights risk free. <laughs> do things you do. I'll take things I do on a mattress for 500. Uh, well, I just did the hacky fucking 80s 
joke structure. Uh, they'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it. Gross, but you will. Helix even has financing options and flexible payment, ladies. Uh, plans so a great night's sleep is never far away. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattresses or mattress orders and two free pillows. All right. We got pillows for people who like to put it on their head. We got pillows for people that hold them between their knees. This read is like the the helix lead they're going to do after the nuclear warhead lands and they're just fucking stuck in a loop of what they were doing right before it land landed. Um, and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash burr. That's Helix Sleep. Dot com, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com, slash burr, B-U-R-R, for up to $200 off all mattresses and two free pillows. There you go. Sleep your afternoon away. All right, that's it. That's perfect, man. 7.30 a.m., my kids are just getting up. My son can now uh, escape the sleep sack. And... Um, and for those of you who are my age and your kids are all grown, if you don't know what a sleep sack is, I don't know when they were invented. It's sort of like a workout vest for a toddler, except you're not doing it so they can work out. You're doing it so they, you know, have difficulties getting out of the uh, their bed. So my son is all muscle and he just pulls himself up and he goes right up and over like Tom Cruise figuring out some shit in the beginning of a, one of those Mission Impossible movies. And now he just comes walking into our bedroom. It's so funny. You just hear his little hand and he opens it up the door. He comes walking in. He just goes, hi. <laughs> and then we're up. So now I have to surround his bed with like pillows because, you know, I just, I, it's one of those deals. If we just had him in a regular bed, he'd get out immediately. So you got to have an obstacle. So now he has to climb up and over this fucking thing. But I still want him to fall down and get hurt because his sister did that and ended up with like literally a cartoon level knot on her head. Um, you know, it's terrifying to me. So I, I just put pillows all around it. Speaking of which, this is freaking me out. I have to go check in. I have to go check in on him. Uh, this is the Thursday afternoon just before Friday Monday morning podcast. Enjoy. Enjoy the... Uh, the music picked up by Andrew Themelis, and we'll have a bonus episode of the Thursday afternoon just before Friday Monday morning podcast to follow. All right? Half-hour episode bonus to come. That's it. Go Red Sox. I'm still hanging in there with them. Um, and thanks to BetMGM for getting us into the game. I've now been to the All-Star game in all four sports. I actually forgot I went to the NHL All-Star game. Um, what's his face? Uh, Joe Bartnick reminded me. All right. I'm going to stop talking now, see if I can find where's the arrow. Where's the arrow? Okay, clicking. Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and uh, this is a very special edition of the Monday Morning Podcast. You know, every once in a while here on the podcast, rather than listening to my psycho ramblings and my jam jams as I lay on my bed, every once in a while uh, I'll have a guest on of high esteem, and uh, this episode is of no uh, exception. This is a man I've done a lot of radio with, but I've never had as a guest. Please welcome the one, the only, the legendary from New Jersey, Mr. Jimmy Norton. Thank you, Bill. What's going on? It's funny. It's like, uh, do you, I know you're such a solo guy when you do your podcast. I almost felt like when I texted you to do it, I almost felt like, ah, I, I, you were the hardest one for me to text. I know you longer than I know any of them. Right. And it was you were the hardest one because I'm like, Bill does it by himself. I didn't want to put him on the spot. But you said you've had some guests. No, on. no, I've had greats. I had... Jay Moore, I've had. Oh, okay. Uh, I've had Dave Kector. I've had uh, Michael Rappaport. Was great. Just the whole sports thing. That guy's like a total like hoop head and all. Is on, really? Yeah, fuck Boston and all that. So we had a great going back and forth. And of course, he trashed me for the Giants beating the Patriots. So I try to get guests that I'm friends with because I'm not the greatest interviewer. Right. And uh, so I definitely, you know, someone that I've done a bunch of radio with. Now, watch, are we feeling the tension that it's all no. going to go off the rails? No, it's funny. It's, it's one of those <laughs> things, though. Whenever you're with a friend or whenever you're interviewing or talking to somebody that you know as well as we know each other, it's all, you almost feel self-conscious. Like, oh, no, they're going to think I'm putting on my performer hat or my interviewer hat or my radio yeah. guy hat. It's like, oh. Jim, tell us, how, how did you get your start? No, I know. And that's what comedy <laughs> podcasts have turned into. Every comic ass, and Colin won't do them. He's like, I'm sick and tired of talking about the fucking process. You know, he doesn't want to hear no, people talk true. about the process, and he's right. I'm actually, 
I'm out of stories. I kind of like tapered back on doing other podcasts. Not because I don't like other podcasts. I just, I've run out of stories. I don't know how many more. Like the amount of times I tell a story and I, yeah, I've probably told this one before, yeah. but uh, I mean, you know, everybody's got your classic half dozen, dozen stories. Unless you're like a guy like Jim Jeffries. And you just live in like a classic yeah. story. It seems every three fucking yeah, weeks. An, alcohol, an active alcoholic. If you're an active alcoholic and you no, always no, have no, he's, stuff. No, 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 he's not that. Is he big. sober now? Yeah, yeah. He's been, he's been, he's been, been a good boy for, a, co- for a couple I'll years. I Jim. Even if he isn't, I'm not going to say he's an active alcoholic. I just got to sit there and be like, you know, he likes having a good time, that Jim yeah. Jeffries. <laughs> yeah, he came in one time and he was, I think, still going from the night before. It was quite enjoyable. I like. I don't drink anymore, but I, I love a guy who's drunk, like on the air. It, oh, know, yeah. It's awful to deal with in real life, but oh. on the air, it's <laughs> Put a microphone fun. in front of him. It's great oh, radio. God, they're great. He brought in – who's that big Irish com- comedian, Andrew something? Uh, he's one of the biggest ones. He does arenas in Ireland. Oh, okay. He came in on St. Paddy's Day, and he was fucking loaded. Not, not Tommy Turning. No, no, no. We've had him too. Oh, okay. I think he was the sober. This guy, I think, is bigger than Tommy. And uh, – he was just so drunk and obnoxious. It was just funny to watch this guy who, in his home country, is a you know he's like Kevin Hart, right? And uh, just loaded and fucking seven o'clock in the morning, blathering, making no sense. <laughs> I'm like, it doesn't matter who, who you are. Thank God I don't drink anymore. No, they don't. They don't fuck around over there. Like it is a, uh, it's a whole other. Th- but I mean, there's definitely. It's not like everybody over there is a drunk, right? But like, there isn't like that. I, I, I sh- I'm saying this as a tourist. I just didn't see the level of concern where everybody's so worried about everybody over here. Like, do you think he has a pro- – I'm really concerned about so-and-so. Like, I didn't feel that vibe over there. It was more like um, if you felt you had a problem, maybe you tried to go to a – an. I don't know if they have AA over there. Is that, oh, yeah. is that worldwide? Sure. Has that spread? Yeah, it's made it everywhere. <laughs> Russia has it. No, it saying. doesn't, does it? Oh, yeah. Everywhere has it. Yeah. That's what I've been told. Are there this. YouTube clips of just like people saying it in all different languages? You know, that's a good question. I've never looked. From what I understand, Stringing the program it. is anonymous, so people don't state their affiliation with it publicly. Just oh, that's take, right. You wouldn't film it. I, they probably wouldn't allow that. Yeah, they'd probably frown on some guy with I'm a, a fucking, fucking moron. No, it's a, how would you know? I mean, Do I mean, people I mean, film the anonymous meeting? Dude, this this is, is the level. This is the level of, of intellect that you're going to get on this. So, <laughs> so fucking settle in. There's nothing wrong with that. It, it's one of those things where everything's online anyway. I right. mean, everything is video. The fact that the fucking first tower getting hit, there's a, a, a clip of that. Hey, I don't have a windscreen on that, so you're popping on Am your keys a little bit. So that's that's my that's my fault. Sorry, no, I'm down to my radio last one. My- five days a week for ten years, and I don't know not to go into a fucking <laughs> microphone. I'm a true idiot. <laughs> but the fact that uh, that's why Opie, by the way, says "but" and not "put." He'll say, uh, "Did you put that down?" Like there's certain words he says "p" is "b" because he. He went to broadcasting went to school. Broadcasting school. Did he? That sounds like such a such a broadcasting school was thing. In college? No, maybe in college he learned. I think he learned in college actually. But he, you know, he went from communications. But um, the fact that there is footage of the first tower getting hit, like that plane going in, and you know, back then everyone didn't have the cell phones or the cameras, is a miracle. Like, so it's not surprising that people think that things are going to be filmed. I don't know why I'm on this right. tangent, but it's, it's not surprising to me. Okay. I'm glad that was a tangent because I was like trying to adjust the level there as you adjust the microphone away from me. I was like, oh my God, he's talking about 9-11. Where the hell did we go? Oh, there? yeah. Just for a second. Just, okay. I just thought of like a weird thing to be on film. Just as a color. Yeah. Just a little something. Just, <laughs> a little, to, little just to bring us back to how lucky we are, Bill. You know, <laughs> how awkward would it be if I just mentioned 9-11 and started blubbering? <laughs> <laughs> anything worse than somebody cries like way too long after 9-11? Oh, by the way, we're sitting in, in Jim's fucking fabulous hotel room, so that would really be fucking uncomfortable. Just creepy, yeah. On, it'd be, it was, if, as long as the mics are on and I feel there's an audience, even though I can't see him, yeah. it wouldn't be that bad. But if, if we were just here by ourselves, which fucking takes me back to a moment. Cleveland? That I Yes. I was in a hotel room pissed. And you fucking knocked on the door and talked me off the fucking ledge. It was it was the gig after the Philly yeah. gig where I was like, I knew that they were going to boo me again just to boo me. Rather than Philly, they booed me because they didn't like me. And then um, by the time the fucking Cleveland gig, you guys gave me so many props that the crowd wanted to see it again. Yeah. So I was asking uh, somebody there, hey, just put me on early. Give me a chance. Just give me a chance. Everybody's like, yeah, 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 don't worry. And then I was in the exact same spot. I go out there and I just walk out. I'm on for two seconds. They just start booing me. 
just to boo me. And I was right. like, look, I'm not going to pretend to get mad because you guys are pretending to boo me and it didn't go anywhere. And I, I got off stage and I was fucking livid. I remember me and Jeff will still laugh about it because Jeff was like, no, no, I'm sorry. I was like, fuck you. <laughs> fuck this venue. <laughs> fuck this state. Fuck everything. And I left. I think I threw a water bottle. Yeah, you were very unhappy. I was I was not happy. And oh, no, because me, I catastrophize in my head. So I was like going. Oh my God! I've become the Booham guy, and I'm going to go any everywhere sure. I go. I kind of forgot because I had been on the virus tour long enough that, um, to me, a normal show was fucking ten thousand people. Right. And I wasn't thinking like my next gig after that tour was at the Punchline. It's like a cozy, right, two hundred people, and I can see everyone, you know. And so if anybody fucked with me, I, c- I could get them. And uh, so, anyways, so I go back to the fucking hotel room. Uh, ready to quit the business and I hear a knock on the door and you came walking in and f- fucking talked me off the ledge. I remember that. I don't even remember what we, sp- we spoke about. I just remember you were very upset and I knew why and you were like, they fucking, and I was like, dude, they did it because they were trying to recapture a moment that they wanted to be a part of something that was very amazing to them as opposed to they hated you. You know what I mean? Oh, but I, I didn't And I was you. convinced everyone was out to get me. The The crowd, the show, uh, uh, not what, what, Live Nation, everybody. I'm mean, still but, convinced they're out to fuck me. I couldn't get on the Oddball Tour this year. <laughs> I can't get on the Oddball Tour, and they're doing fucking the Tweeter Center and uh, and played uh, half PNC. those places. What's that? You've played half of those places. Yeah, and I can't get on the. Uh, I couldn't get a fucking set on the Oddball. Ah, whatever. They'll have it next year. Yeah, you know, know how this shit is. Guys like you and me, we always got to fucking. We always got to go the extra fucking whatever it is. It, it was always. Remember that when they were doing the half hours. Yeah. On on uh, on Comedy Central or or the whatever the fuck there was, it was always the guy with the silly hat, the person with the catchphrase, the hot chick, the fat guy, you know, the black guy who doesn't scare white people. They had right. to get through all of those, <laughs> and then they also had to get the veterans that they fucked over on the last group of half hours. They have to get rid of all of those fucking guys, and then and then it was always us afterwards i never did one for comedy central i was so resentful over being passed over i was like fredo i just was like fuck these guys i'm not gonna do it. and then i, wait, I waited for HBO. i'm funny too yeah not like everybody says yeah well that's the way doug wanted it it's the way i wanted it yeah <laughs> <laughs> so I wound, I wound up uh said i want to hold out for hbo and uh, that we finally did them for hbo and they were supposed to do four and they were going to be really these special half hours and now uh, they wound up doing 10 of them and, um, you know, I'm happy we did it. But yeah. I'm glad I held out for HBO. Yeah, you did, and you did the same year um, the same year that I did it. Were you on? Were you on okay, it was. So yeah. It was, it was I me. taped with Patrice. You taped with Kevin That's Brennan, right. right? I still remember that. And then Louis C.K. Yeah. Here's, the thing, here's the thing. One time, um, you know, because I'm obsessed with trying to own everything I did. You know, I tried to buy my half hour back from HBO, but they wanted me to buy the whole – I had to buy the whole fucking series. I had to buy like all ten of them. It How was much like, did they want? Oh, Jesus. It was like, you know, in the millions. So it was just – I mean I was looking at it like, well, it cost me 130 to shoot an hour. So I ought to be able to offer them 65, fucking yeah. 65. And they were like, no, you have to buy the whole season and like, you know, fucking – I don't know, some – other thing to throw money at the Sopranos or something to get it, but I, I wish I had the money because. But nowadays everyone just steals everything anyway, so it's probably dumb. But when I was looking back at that, I'm like, that series is fucking insane. Yeah, that's you, Patrice O'Neill, rest his soul, is the yeah. fucking greatest I ever saw. Uh, Louis Earthquake, that's right. Fly the Concords was one. Fly to the Concords was one. That's right. I forgot they were on it. They wanted me to do it with those guys, and I didn't yep. want to. I did one, and I was just like, uh, you know. I, I think once what's his face bought delirious off of him, they were shy. They got a little gun shy. Oh, he owns it now, Murphy. I didn't know that. Mm-mm. No, what's his face coming up next? Comics Unleashed. That guy. Oh, Byron Allen. Owns Byron it? Allen bought that motherfucker. Delirious. HBO showed that fucking thing, and then they just when we were kids, teenagers, and uh, they just never showed it again they had it in their library and somehow byron allen went in and there and bought it off of them how much right but be- i don't know what he paid for like a couple million bucks and right before the whole dvd thing died he put it out at like 15 20 a whack and he sold like four million of them or oh, something wow. yeah <laughs> he's a genius <laughs> he's that a guy. Fucking, he is and a lot of people don't really i don't like talking about people's money but this fucking guy it's like this guy he has like three quarters oprah money and people don't even know yeah, they just look at him like he's one of those guys. Like you know, like how Seinfeld sees a show where everybody else sees just hanging out. Right, he's one of those guys. Like I saw Seinfeld on uh, um, the Daily Show the other day talking to John Stewart, and 
they were joking how he was saying how he did TV right, how he just did it, did it once, it lives forever. And John Stewart, when he does an episode of The Daily Show, it's it's all topical. So no one's going to buy the box set of The Fucking Daily right. Show. And um, I'm, Jesus, I'm taking the long way around here. So he was talking about the new TV show he's doing uh, on, the, on, on the net, which is fucking uh, Comedians in Cars getting coffee. And he said, which is what I would be doing anyway. Right. So Byron Allen was a guy who took those press junkets when you were just like, what was it like to work with Steven Spielberg? Talk about Mel Gibson, blah, 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 all that. He actually saw a show. And then that's where he came up with that coming up next thing. It was just the fucking press junkets. I don't know what coming up next is. That's, he would say, coming up next, oh. Jim Norton, talking about the Vice show that oh, okay. he's on and blah, blah, blah. And he turned, that, he turned that into a fucking TV show. That Comics Unleashed is genius. It's literally just and, – and it's the worst setups of all time. It's, it's just do your act for, for three minutes but, in a clip. But it's fucking genius. And he produces the whole thing. He owns the whole fucking – the guy is a genius. Like, he's like a hero of mine as far as like the way he does like this business. Yeah. He's basically – for people uh, – from. This is too uh, going too quick here. He basically, that show, if you don't watch it, it's just Byron Allen sitting there with three or four other comics. He already knows what your bits are. Oh, yeah. So you've already written the whole fucking show for him, and all he does is just say your setup. Like, so, Jim, uh, have you ever, uh, you ever lived in a fucking building in New York? And then you're like, as a matter of fact, I have. And the other comics on that drive, because nobody's calling each other out. Like, they're all, like, just participating. Like, it is a really a good time we're having. Like, yeah. how can three comedians sit there and listen to a guy do a bit off that setup and not want to fucking attack him? Well, like, they can't do that because then they get sued by Tough Crowd. Yeah, you know what? I guess that's what, that, that's what made the, Tough Crowd fun. Tough Crowd was fucking awesome. That, that can- has such a... Such a cult following. Do you know people, they ask me, like, just as much, for, for just a long a time, like, uh, when's Chappelle's show coming back and when's Tough Crowd coming yeah. back? Those two shows had, like, uh, these diehard fans, and I, I still don't, um, I, I don't understand. What about Colin, huh? Getting that, he got his own show, and he gave every comedian in New York a TV credit. Yeah. Just about. Like, I, I was trying to... I remember towards the, the last uh, season of that, I was trying to think of somebody who hadn't been on it. He got everybody on that I show. think he did, yeah. It was Bobby – Bobby wasn't a regular on it, but Bobby was on it a couple of times. Um, I th- Bobby I Kelly? Yeah. Oh, I, I thought he was on it quite a bit. No, I don't think he was. I could be wrong about that. Maybe I'm thinking Opie and Anthony because he didn't do Opie and Anthony on NEW. He didn't do that till we were on satellite. So maybe he was on Tough Crowd more than I thought. Right. But I remember him being talked about warm-up for it at one point. He's like, I don't want to fucking warm-up, dude. You know, man, Bobby gets – so I think that uh, – <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very short fuse. So I think that he was on a few times, but I didn't. I don't think I ever did it with him. Right. He get mad at me too. He got mad at me because I, I didn't remember that we went to Vegas. Like I remember we went to Vegas together, but not the actual fight. And he got very angry at me. I'm like, I, I'm like, yeah, that was your right favorite. He's like, fuck, dude, I know. I was fucking there with you. I'm like, oh, all right, right. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> forgot. <laughs> I can't make fun of anybody. If I have a temper, but he's another guy who he's always had to go the extra fucking 12 miles. He's just one of those guys. He does got that short thing. I remember one time I was walking down the street with him and he was talking, you know, we all just start complaining about the business. So he was complaining about the business and he was going to, uh, he was going to help me with the computer. You know, he's great with the computer. So he was going to help me. And as we were walking, I used to live around the corner from him and I'm thinking, well, my computer's up on the, you know, the fucking whatever, the seventh floor and he's on the ground floor. And I'm thinking in my head. Let me go up and get the computer and we'll take it over to his house. So as he's telling like his, you know, fucking 20th story about this business, I said, hey, Bob, what if I, what if, can I just go up and get that? And he just fucking snapped and he goes, don't interrupt me, cunt. <laughs> fucking screamed it. <laughs> screamed it on Ninth Avenue in like broad daylight. And he, dude, like everybody, fuck, you know, people looking and shit. And I just looked at him like. <laughs> And the old me would have taken the bait, and I would have gotten to this big fuck you, fuck you fight. Uh, and I don't even know if this is the new me. I just was not in – I don't know. I just wasn't in a place where I was mad or anything. Yeah. He, he so came out of nowhere that I just kind of looked at him. And I was like, Bob, I thought we kind of got past doing this to each other. And then he kind of laughed, and it was gone, which he's always been able to do. As much as that guy yeah. flips the fuck out, he's able to bring it back down and be like, all right, dude, listen, dude. I'm yeah, he's sorry. not a grudge holder necessarily. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So he fucking uh, – that was like an instant Bobby classic, don't interrupt me, cunt. Yeah, that's – what a great Echo- line. Echoing. Yeah. <laughs> I just like how he said it like I worked for him. <laughs> like I felt like he should have been behind some big walnut desk. Well, is it? Maybe we could do this. Don't interrupt me, cunt. <laughs> 
I'm uh, talking because you fucked this uh, up. You know? That makes me so happy. <laughs> that makes me so happy. That, that's a fucking Bobby scream, and I'm really happy that that happened to somebody other than me. Oh, no. He's a frightening guy when he fucking yells. I hate to admit it, but Bobby's a fucking maniac. Oh, he, he does scare me. I, I would call him a maniac, but that's uh, that's the old pot and kettle there. I'm out of my fucking mind, dude. Like when I'm out here, I, I literally had to make a rule about just relaxing when I drive. And one thing that I helped is very therapeutic for me is letting people go. Right. If you're really like in a I, – I get so frustrated with the quality of the driving out here, the inability to fucking make turns at a decent speed – and and dude, when they go buy shit out here, the second they pass it, it's it. They don't even remember it. They have no. There's no fucking clue as to what's behind you. Like you know what they do here out here that fucking drives me nuts. You'll be sitting behind some guy at a red light, you know, and you're up on his bumper, you know, like you're supposed to be. Nothing crazy. And as the light turns green, he then puts his left fucking directional it's, on. It's absolute enraging and it's self-centered. And yeah, it's it's it's. I'm with you. It's, it's is it wrong that I fantasize about pushing him into traffic? And no, into it's wrong that you don't have the moral courage to do it. <laughs> I think that's totally. <laughs> I think that's totally right. And whenever you hear about someone getting shot and killed for road rage, everyone first goes, "Oh my god, that maniac that shot that person." And I, honest to God, the first thing I think is. I'm glad. Like, and until I find out the guy with the gun was the dick right. who, who fucked up first. I love that you have to find out that the guy with the gun was the dick. I, I know. To, to find out. Until I wrong. find out the guy with the gun overreacted <laughs> yeah. a little. <laughs> but it's just there's something about – because people are so self-centered and narcissistic when they drive. It, it's a reflection of who they really are. So that's why we take it so fucking personally, man. Like, let, you let people go. If, the guy, if, 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 if a guy doesn't wave thank you to me, that's hey, don't me do that out cardinal here. sin. They don't do that out here. And I, I go from like being this fucking Mother Teresa person. I turn into the devil. It, it starts. I try to stay calm. It starts with a couple of reallys in my car. I just go, really? 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 You're not going to fuck these fucking people out here? I don't know what the fuck I ever moved out here for. I, I end up turning into that just because some douche. Dude, you see the look on their face. They're like, please, please, please let me go. And you go to let them go. And you think oh, like, oh, hey, right. thumbs up, something, nothing. They immediately are just back into their own uh, – yeah. I don't know. I find sometimes I wave at people out here and they look at me like weird. Like, what, do you know me? Like maybe – you know, I did move 2,500 miles away from where I learned you know, societal rules. So maybe uh, – but you know, you just think if, you know, if you're waving to another white guy, I mean we're pretty fucking generic. Yeah. You know, there's not a lot of depth to the culture here. Yeah, there's, there's no gang signs <laughs> in our way. I can see black guys get a little freaked out watching which way your fingers are turned. <laughs> Well, plus East Coast, though, is, is so aggressive, and I hate to do, like, an L.A. thing, but out here, maybe that courtesy, like, you know, in Boston or New York, if someone lets you cut in, it's like, hey, motherfucker, I did you a courtesy. And you're like, hey, thank you for the courtesy. Yeah, you're a good shit, dude. You're welcome. You're welcome. But here, it's like, well, that was just expected because they might do that for each other more out here, and oh, so it's right. not a big deal. That's the only way I can think of I was on the Pennsylvania Turnpike one time driving to a gig, and I know I'm popping all over. I'm very self-conscious talking. So I no, you're, doing, you're doing much better, but, but I, don't have, I don't have anybody to help us out with this. Okay. I was uh, driving to a gig, and a guy cut into my lane. I was doing about 70. It was raining, and he had a, a, a trailer. It was a <laughs> Which nightmare. is normal. And I'm like – I'm, I'm, I'm hydroplaning. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was a real-wheel drive too with my Mustang. <laughs> Real punk of shit fucking hydroplaning car. Good call. And I'm driving, and, and this guy's coming into my lane. And I immediately, your mind, when you think you're going to die, goes very quickly. And I'm like, okay, you got to slam on the brakes. You're going to have an accident. Hit the wall. Like, it try to. It's, it, yeah, it, that's smart. Yeah, slow, slow yourself down, sideswipe. Hit the wall. So I jam on the brake. I hit the horn. And he veers out, and we don't have the accident. So then I'm, I'm not afraid. I'm in a rage at this fucking guy. Right. And I pull up next to him. And it's a, it's a, you know, a fat black dude, like, you know, a family mopey guy. And I'm, I'm ready to really, you know. It's whatever. Cleveland from Family Guy. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> William Stevenson, for those of you that go to the comedy show. <laughs> and uh, he looks at me and he gives me the like, oops, I fucked up wave. Like, oops, sorry. And he gives me that. And every bit of anger drained. You can't because he, he, he just owned up to it. I'm sorry. And sorry. Yeah. I waved I, back. No problem. Yeah. That was it. In a second, my rage <laughs> was gone. Do you know what's funny? I sometimes when somebody acts on the rage, even though I know it's wrong, I sort of live through the, the fucking ecstasy that that must be. Like, do you remember when Russell Crowe threw the phone, phone yes. at the guy? I just can't imagine like when you're in a hotel and you're not getting the customer service you want. <laughs> On whatever it is that the fact that you actually take the machine that they won't help you with 
and fucking hurt somebody, the person who's not helping you, you fucking hurt him with it. Yeah. Completely wrong thing to do. But I can't imagine. I always was wondering, like, when he's letting that phone go, just, ah, just fucking all that rage going at him. I think it was it was good for him. It was bad for the guy behind the uh, behind the counter. Behind the counter was bad. Well, two people learned a lesson that day. Russell Crowe learned not to do it. The other guy probably learned better fucking customer service yeah. next time. <laughs> because I remember when that happened. I was in the Greenwich Hotel, in, uh, which De Niro owns. And I, I remember – like, the, Oh, my God. That's a really nice place. It's beautiful. Like he would stay at a dive. What a stupid comment. But I remember thinking the satisfaction it must have felt when the phone hit the guy. Like how good that must have felt to throw that phone at that motherfucker. And again, he got in big trouble for that. But yeah, that was a story that I. Do think you know how got. mad you are? You, you're you're pulling the wires out of the wall, and that voice is still not going. Okay, what are you doing, yeah. dude? What are you doing? And then yeah. you you wrap it up. You leave your hotel. You're walking down the hall. You leave your room. You get into the fucking elevator, and your brain's still going. Yeah, throw it at him. Yeah, throw oh, it. Is at that him. what happened? Well, I mean, he I, he went downstairs to the front. I mean, I don't. Know. I was just when you picked the phone up off the desk and just threw it at him. Oh, I thought he was upstairs in his room. Maybe he was, but I thought that he, I didn't. I didn't. I thought he just picked the phone up and threw it at the guy. That makes way more sense. But if I find out that he actually wrapped the cord and took the phone from downstairs, that makes me love him more. I was. <laughs> I loved him just for picking it up. I probably put- fucked it up. I fuck up everything. I don't know. Do you know the other day I I actually called the periodic chart. I called it the periodical. That's, yeah, but that's understandable. I mean, one. I was on magazine. Breaking Bad. <laughs> There's no excuse. It's like you're on a you're on a western and you call it a cowboy hat. <laughs> How do you not fucking know? It shows you the amount of fucking research I did. Dude, sometimes on Twitter when you get trashed, it's just so fucking on the money and I I, I always read if, if people are just being mean to be mean, but when they call me out for the, all the stupid shit, it really uh, <laughs> it makes being on Twitter worth it. Yeah. Because other than hyping your shows, it's usually just a bunch of people giving you shit sure it is. with half the fucking information. B- pause on that. Um, they fucking and then then it just becomes like uh, you know it just becomes like why am I on this thing? Because it'll literally put you in a bad mood. Then every once in a while, somebody get, like that guy waving. You know, in the car, it just gives you shit in the right way, and it makes you fucking laugh. You retweet, they psych to retweet them, and it just it becomes like all right. I'm fucking cool with Twitter again. I have a piece of, of criticism. Somebody bashed me one time. And I actually have it on my, my desktop. And I, I, I've opened it a few times and read it. It was just about like, you know, I used to love Jim. But he, but the guy made some valid points as to what I do wrong on the radio. And uh, about how like – and I felt oh, that – Oh, it's like constructive criticism? Yeah, but he was mad. But I actually felt like, yeah, this is actually coming from a guy who is a fan and who just thinks I've been quite a cunt for a while. And uh, – <laughs> You know what? I, I I read it and it just resonated with me. Like this guy is not wrong. I mean, I don't like what he said, yeah, but I it's a very mature way it. of handling criticism. Oh, but yeah, I normally it, it's it's much more like rageful. I want to find out who they are, and I, you know, I get very very angry. And uh, this time it just it just got me right. I'm like, I know he's being honest. Yeah, and he's like, oh, I have been doing that. Ugh. It feels exposing yeah. when some stranger just notices your fucking your weaknesses and your crutches. I've had a couple of heckles like that. Oh. Where they kind of put you in your place and you got to be like – you want to be like, uh, what do you do for a living? That sucks. But you have to be like – I finally learned at one point. Oh, you know something? I actually learned about handling the hecklers in a different way watching you. I did down at Caroline's. It finally clicked. I, I learned through watching you, you don't have to chop all their heads off. Sometimes they are ordering food. Sometimes they're just repeating a, a, a punchline. Like I saw – I forget what you – they were talking, and you, you just kind of said something. What'd you say? Oh, okay. And, and you kind of like, you actually asked them what they said. I think that that's what it was, rather than just assuming right. that they were trashing you, saying that you sucked. Because the amount of times I kept having this reoccurring thing, where someone, if anybody talked, I was convinced they were saying that I sucked, and they were making fun of how I looked or whatever. You know, it's the first eight nine years of my yeah. career, and I would chop their heads off. And the amount of times afterwards, people would come up to me. At the end of shows going, I was just asking where the bathroom was or I, I was actually saying I enjoyed your act and blah, 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 blah. And then I felt like I, I couldn't get out of it, man. I, I Like I was locked in this, you know, get them, get them, get them, get them, get them right. kind of vibe. And then I was watching you and I, and I was – it took me a while to learn how to do that. Well, I had one too. It's uh, Once in a while that will happen at the cellar because that's such a loud, small area where you'll say something to say, you'll hear somebody talking. And I, I can always see if it's somebody ordering a drink, then I leave it alone, um, you know, because it's a small room. But once in a while, you'll hear talking. And I've had a few people, like, diff- over the years go, like, 
What would what, what, you say? I just think, I think you're funny. I'm enjoying you. And then I just kind of – now. then I, I repeat that and I just kind of get the audience to laugh at me with it because it's like, all right, they all know I was about to yeah. attack the person. Yeah. I mean, you know, they all know that this was an almost heckle. So did you always do that or is that something – I think I learned it in a place called uh, Arbajans, which was uh, – it's where I first met Aries Spears back in like 1991 when he was going – mom would bring him to open mics and he would do these RoboCop impressions. But he was too young to get in by himself, so his mother took him. And it was a, a, a Sheraton bar area. And, uh, Jeez, just, I, I just had felt a wave of depression. I probably the, did that gig. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, East Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, when did you start? What year? I started March of 92. Okay, yeah, so you might have. It was right around that time. Well, I started up in, in Massachusetts, and then I worked. I got down to New York. Uh, I probably did my first road gig out there, end of 95, beginning oh, of 96. Okay. But I remember going out to those some of those Jersey ones in those hotels. Awful. Yeah, they were either great or you just were driving home fucking – that's you know thousand yard stare like oh my what what have I done? I remember doing one with Vinnie Brand and Bob Levy where there was a pool I believe in between us and the audience. I'll never forget that gig. We were on one side. It was a Holiday Inn <laughs> and it was in the pool area, and we were it was it, it which was, is an obvious place for a comedy yeah, show. A wonderful place to try your art. <laughs> Wet feet slapping by as you're fucking trying to do your jokes. Yeah, it was really bad. I remember Vinnie, or we were in the front, but I remember there was a pool. I think between us and the crowd. But in that Arbajans room, I was, I was ha- smashing a heckler. Arbajans. And uh, nobody was laughing in the back. And then I realized, like, oh, they can't hear what is being said. Right. Repeat what they say. A, it buys you a, a, another couple seconds and nobody knows you're doing it. Right. Isn't that weird, like, how with the audience, we know we're – like, you know, someone's like, you know, you, you suck. You're terrible. I suck and I'm terrible. It's like you've just bought yourself – yeah. And if you hit the you still get credit. Time. Priceless time. Yeah. Yeah. It's really weird. Do you I don't know how to explain this to people. When when, when people are like, how did you come up with that that fast? Like, I don't know. When you see a funny moment, I don't mean a written joke, but if someone slams you and you're great at fucking firing back immediately. Like Donald Hammond said he sees impressions as colors, like a yellow or an orange, or he can't explain it. When when I see like slamming something as like – it's like these weird choices you're making. They're kind of floating in front of you. Like you don't see the words. Is like, that why you're so – because you got the fastest mind of anybody. When you used to sit at the table at the cellar, dude, when you – Patrice was the, like <laughs> – would just make you fucking – Yeah. You'd start crying when he – he was the be- – but like as far as speed – like, I thought Patrice, a lot of times, he would use his laugh to drown you out. Like, he had all these different things. You would just sit there. I remember when you would start looking at me, I was like, oh, fuck, he's looking at me. He's looking. It was a different thing. Like, with Keith, I felt Keith Robinson, Keith, you, you, could, get, you could get a mitt in his face <laughs> <laughs> to try to throw him off. Like, Keith, stop looking at me, blah, blah, blah. And that would make him forget what he was yeah. going to say. But you never forgot. And Voss, all you had to do was Vo- – I had techniques for all you guys to survive the pond. <laughs> Voss, all you had to do was lay on the ropes and eventually he yes. would say something that bombed and then it would come back on him. He always got bit. He would hit you one, two, three times and then that fourth or fifth one would be so bad it bombed that everyone would then jump on him. So you, you never really had to get him back. Voss would, Voss would be pounding you and pounding you, but he always got greedy and threw a right-hand lead. Yeah. <laughs> He would always punch himself out. He'd always punch himself out. But how do you see when you when you're whether it's a heckler or whatever? How do you? I can't explain to people how that works. Like how how do you think of a joke or a funny thing to say? It, it's almost like it's I just think, like watching things float in front of you and you grab at them. I look at it more like in the beginning, it was like remember like I have to have these stock lines. Right. Hey, where'd you learn how to whisper? Helicopter. In a, a <laughs> helicopter factory? Yeah. Like, what is that? They're already on? Yeah. It, didn't even, <laughs> it didn't even make sense. And it always got a laugh. Um, but it was more like those. I had those stock lines, and then it became – I was watching Greg Fitzsimmons, and I've told him this before on his show. I learned from Greg where Greg would just ask him – like, Greg is fucking unbelievable. Unbe- he's so good at, at fucking with people in the crowd. I remember one time we were playing this place, the the Grill 93, and uh, oh my god, where was it? It was up, it was on Route 93, it's Massachusetts. Yeah, it was not Arlington. That was where Dane was from. What Springfield. F- I can't even begin with an A. I don't remember. And um, Andover, Mass. Andover. There you go. Yeah, the Grill 93 in Andover, Mass. And these two guys showed up with matching American flag shirts. <laughs> And they sat in the front row, 
And Greg was so good at trashing people. Like I, I was either hosting or featuring, but me and the host or me and the feature both said to Greg, Greg, we're not going to fuck with those guys, but you have to promise us that you're going to write at the beginning, go after them. And he goes, absolutely, absolutely. So we deliberately did not. I mean, those guys wanted to get picked on and Greg ended up going up there and he just started telling this story that just went all the way around the fucking bend to the point people were like, what is he talking about? And somehow he brought it around the beat. You know, I mean, that would be like, I don't know, like wearing matching American flags, <laughs> shirts with your friends or something. And then he just pointed at the guys and opened his mouth like David Lee Roth, you know, when he looks at the back row and it just fucking absolutely destroyed. I saw him one time at the Kowloon. He, he fucking, he, by that, it was like Hannibal Lecter shit. He could tell by the shoes the guy was wearing. He guessed the guy's name in four guesses. He guessed his job. The table the guy was sitting at was going nuts. And it was just all, and of course, his name was horrible. His job was horrible. Where he lived was horrible. He started, he did a little vignette of their family. Like, he's unbelievable at doing stuff like that. So I, so that's funny. When people ask me, you know, who are your influences, blah, blah, blah. You know, as much as it was the, the greats that you listen sure. to, people don't understand that not only did you learn, you know, I was watching Attell, CK, and all those sure. guys who were beyond me, but I learned watching guys that were, uh, you know, breaking in at the same time Our I peers. did. Sure, sure. Yeah, where you're starting to... Because I, I, a lot of times you would, you, were, you would get yourself into the same situation that a more seasoned guy wouldn't, and I would watch you get out of it and be like, oh, that's... I never thought to do it that way. Right. That's how you that's how you take it and stop it before it goes off the cliff and the hole. Because I, I realized, too, that a lot of times I would lose crowds by hitting too hard. Like, you know, a guy throws up something that deserves a four. It's almost yeah. like in – You uh, go right to – I hope you get AIDS. Yeah, right to him. Yeah. Like, what's that? What's that? <laughs> Your fucking wife's got can't. Like, what? Dude, but, but this totally unnecessary. <laughs> like, it was, and the crowd hates you for it. So it's like – the worst is when someone's heckling you in the front. I'll never forget this guy heckling me at Rascals. I was a new comic, but even back then I knew this guy was being a twat because he was, he, was, he was heckling me, and it wasn't horrible shit that he was saying, but it was his eyes. Like I knew he's the fucking – that scumbag in the office who's resentful that he's not up here getting laughs. Like, uh -huh. hey, yeah, 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 and the, the audience can't see it. So I was pounding him, and I really ruined his night, and uh, the crowd hated me for it. Because they couldn't see what a dick he was. But you know how, like, you know, yeah. you just know. Oh, yeah, of course I do. And you can always <laughs> that tell when they're a zillion being... times. I, I'll never, never regret doing it, though. It's like, that's 25 years ago. It's been my first year of comedy. And I still feel good that I wrecked that piece of shit's night because I uh, knew he was coming after me. You know, me. I saw, I remember I was at the punchline in Atlanta and I had a guy like that. And all I can remember about what he looked like was he had loafers with no socks and he had fat feet. So there was like, the, <laughs> they were like bulging out the front and he kept putting his feet on the stage. So I made the joke to take him, you know, to take him off or whatever. And it's, you know, because he really, you know, had, I mean, he just was fucking annoying me. And it was a, just the fact that he kept putting him back. I knew that it wasn't, oh, I'm sorry. I just need to stretch my legs out. There was some sort of power sure. thing going. You're breathing mm -hmm. into the mic there. There was like a power thing. You, you, okay. <laughs> there was like this power thing going on with him. And it literally escalated to the point that they had to kick him out. And he, when he stood up, he made sure he got on the stage and took like half a step towards me. And he was just, you know, this little fucking, I don't know. He probably was doing well in business and he was used to people telling, right. not, you know, telling other people what to do. And, uh, but whatever, here we are. Now we're sitting here talking about the process. Uh, I want to make sure that I, I get to the whole reason. Why is a fancy man like yourself out here in, uh, in Los Angeles, do you got you, you, are you, you working on something? What's going on? Well, my, was, thanks Bill. That was, <laughs> my advice show is, uh, coming on and, uh, you know, I just had to come out and plug it. It's hard to plug. Shit, oh, man. it isn't. That's great dude. what, tell me about the show. I'm happy about it to do it. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's an interview show. So I, I talk to, you know, I do a monologue. I mean, I feel ashamed whenever I explain things. That Why? Are good. I don't know. It's that whatever makes me a comic is that, that fucking right, right. shame thing. Colin, Colin described it as shame spirally. Um, you know, it, it's hosting a talk show and it's, I always wanted to do it. So I hosted, uh, I did four episodes and you do a monologue, a sketch. You're hosting a talk show. Yeah. Yeah. That's fucking great. Yeah. I'm happy, man. It's, uh, my first guests are, are, were, were Tyson and Dana White together. Then it was awesome. I and mean, it was like a really good interview. And I was like, wow, man, that went well. I've never seen, and I mean this in a good way. I've never seen him give a guy like you. A no, talk show. They don't. That's great. Yes. Yeah, because usually it's, you know, they're usually telling, you know, if you're doing a talk show, hey, Jim, kind of tone it down a little. So yeah. what, what, uh, what channel is it on? It's on vice.com. It's, the, you know, it's, uh, it's online, which is kind of where I wanted it. And now, can uh, you curse and stuff? You do whatever you want. Total content freedom. 
Oh, I, my I had God. total content freedom. Um, my, Bailey J is my co-host, um, and she's kind of like my announcer. Do you know Bailey? Yeah. Lovely girl. And, uh, you know, so I, I, think it's, I think it turned out. It was Bobby's suggestion. It's like, dude, you got to get Bailey involved. And uh, I think it's... I think it's oh, funny. Bailey J, the, uh, yeah, 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 okay, okay. Who the so, fuck was I thinking of? I interviewed, uh, you know, I interviewed Freeway Rick. You know who that, the, the drug dealer, the ex-drug dealer? He's no, the guy Rick Ross took his name, name from. Oh, oh, oh. That's just, that sounds like a 70s black guy nickname. It is. It's it is? He did 20 years. Yeah, he did, and he was a big dealer in the 80s. He, he was like with the Iran-Contra uh, scandal, like he was buying... The guy he was getting his drugs from was was funneling money to the Contras, and then uh, you know Rick went to jail for he got life without parole, but he's out now on a technicality because they it was like a three strikes thing or whatever, but they charged him twice. So for the who same thing. optioned the rights for this fucking great movie? I, you Somebody's got to own him. No one. He, Michael K. Williams is playing him in something. In, in, a, in a, there's a the reporter who broke his story is being played by Jeremy Renner, and I think the reporter committed suicide because people laughed at him. The whole Iran Contra thing and the drug connection and the CIA putting money in the black neighborhoods. We had TI. And wait a minute, they laughed at him, so he. The reporters back then, they didn't think he was right. Like I think when he was talking about the government, the CIA allowing drugs into these ghetto neighborhoods. How bad did they laugh at him? He must have been getting. Fucking... Yeah, yeah. He probably they... expected a Pulitzer. And they were like, were no. they hanging him from his press undies every day <laughs> from the typewriter? <laughs> Yeah. They keep picking on me, man. I can't take it. I <laughs> swear to God, there's a connection. They're letting the drugs come in. I fucking feel it. Yeah, and then he wound up uh, blowing his brains out by being proven right. We thought T.I. was T.I. was on a week before I interviewed Rick Ross, and we were like, eh, it sounded kind of paranoid. Dude, those are great guests. Uh, well, T.I. was on Opie and Anthony, not on... Uh, Whatever. But he was talking about the, the, the drugs with the black neighbors. Like, ah, I don't know. It sounded a little bit conspiracy. And then Rick Ross did the same thing. I'm like, fuck, man. T.I. was right. Like, I've heard it from too many different sources that the CIA apologized. It was really interesting. So he was a good interview. And then I did a couple of uh, comedians. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll do more. No, dude. I, you got to... When, when's, when's this coming out? This Wednesday, July 23rd. And how does I, I can't say what time. Like I guess when when are they going to upload it? I don't know. I'll just Twitter it. I'm not sure. They, they you know it's like they. I don't know how this one works. Like I, I'm used to doing promotion for stuff. Like I know exactly what day it's on. I know exactly what time it's on. Right. The first episode is being released in two parts because it's uh, you know it's a, it's like a 45 minute interview plus 20 other minutes of content. So it's like one day and then the next day and then they can watch the whole thing. Uh, yeah. I Dude, just, that sounds like a great great guess. And then, you know, sidekick, nobody has anybody like Bailey J. That's great. And then usually a guy like you doesn't get – you guys – They usually you're usually the guy the way they're like, all right, you know, just tone it down, tone it down. So to see a, a real – I can't say I don't want to insult anybody, but like somebody – my taste – Thank you. Actually going out, doing a monologue and that type of stuff that you're going to pick on. That's fucking awesome, man. It felt so nice to not have to tone it down because in one of the episodes, I just did a bunch of Sterling stuff, which I've been doing on stage. But it's like, how long is that going to be you know, good for right. And um, I He was to... a fun one. Oh, my oh. God. I hope he lives forever. I, live... I hope with my angle on it still because my special's coming out and I, and I was able to turn that into something. Like, I'm hoping I, I, the point that I'm making uh, – is still relevant. Is there anything worse than when you shoot something and it winds up, something happens in the meantime, which dates the reference or the bats? Yeah, no, but it happens because this is, the, I think sometimes I, I, I try not to overthink that thing where, you know, if you, even a guy like Richard Pryor talked about the heavyweights of his time, because, you know, there, there's some comics that are like, you know, don't do anything, wear anything that's going to make you look fucking you know, in three years, you oh, can be right. like, like the cutting edge fashion, like take uh, uh, like Sinbad, like some of the stuff that that guy right. wore, you know what I mean? Like some of that, sh just in general, some of the shit from the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s was pretty out there. Um, so some people try to go, oh, just wear black on black, very kind of simple thing. And, and then don't do anything topical because it's going to date your special. And it's like, who gives a fuck? Yeah, who cares? Yeah. I know if it's a great joke. It's a great joke, like uh, that prior one. I forget. He's talking about the old retired black fighter who was refereeing, and the ref, uh, one of the fighters, was beating the shit out of a white guy, and he just and he was joking that the guy wouldn't stop. Like, oh shit, he looks okay, or whatever. <laughs> and that's still funny. Yeah, it's still fucking funny. So I think if the joke is there, it. Let's see, I'm trying to convince myself. Wait, what did Pryor say? And it's it's it was a Jerry Quarry joke. 
right. about it was something about how he just you know, he just loves black people beating him up, and it made me laugh so hard. And it was forty years after he said it. It doesn't matter. Woody Allen stuff. He does references from the early sixties. It's hilarious. Yeah. Carlin opens one of the specials. You know the Reagan people. I don't care. I learned who Jerry Quarry was through Richard Pryor. I didn't know who James Brown was until Eddie Murphy did the bit. All right. I, I I was that fucking white, like the world I was living in, and and. And people would be like, how the fuck did that, how did, how did you not know who he was? And it was like, well, my parents were that fucking white, and then there was three channels, you know? Right. And there was no internet, and it was like, you know, I, I, I knew who the fucking Jeffersons were. I mean, that was like the only thing that was on TV, it seemed, but good times. But as far as stuff like that, it was really difficult for a guy like him, even when he became an icon. You know, I just saw recently he did like the Mike Douglas show. He, he did some shows, but I mean, I was a little kid, so I, I just didn't see him. So I remember laughing at the Eddie. I told Charlie this story and he was beside himself. He was almost offended. He goes, get the fuck out of here. Fuck that. You knew who he was. Your parents knew who he was. I'm like, I didn't. I didn't know who arguably the greatest performer of the last century was. Um, Do you ever see James Brown and Pavarotti? They did, a, they did It's a Man's World yeah. together. How awesome is that? It was that? unbelievable. Unbelievable! You tell they really liked each other. It was, that was a really I love stuff like that. Man. Yeah, when they like to me that that's a mashup. Like I don't like when they just take two songs out of the same tempo when it's yeah. supposed to blow my fucking mind. Yeah. It's like, yeah, well, if you get two songs at the same speed, you drop some shit out and you throw some shit in, yeah. right? Not yeah. that I could ever figure out how to do it. No, I couldn't. There is a genius to it, but I still resent it the same. I understand hating it. Like I respect it's hard to do, but fuck them, it stinks. All right, everybody, here's the advertising for this week. I apologize for the bad edit. I just interviewed Jim on, like, Friday or something when he was in town. And, you know, we just did it straight through without the advertising because I didn't have it yet. So now I'm in my house. It's, like, 7.30 Monday morning, and my wife is still sleeping. So I got to... uh I got to read in this creepy voice. So you're going to have to fucking deal with it. All right? You just fucking deal with it. This is going to be my voice. Dollar Shave Club, everybody. The big razor companies think we're stupid. Every year they roll out some ridiculous shaving technology gimmick and expect us to flip out and shell out big bucks for it. Do you really need a razor with a vibrating handle or a roller pivot ball, back scratcher, egg timer, laser pointer, corkscrew? You get the point. Okay? You don't need it. All right? We were all just shaving fine before any of that crap, and I personally definitely don't need to spend my hard-earned cash on it. Um, If you're sick of being treated like a moron, join the hundreds of of thousands of smarter people who joined the Dollar Shave Club. Club.com revolution. Dollar Shave Club delivers the best blades and grooming supplies for just a few bucks a month. Their blades are better than the big shave companies for a fraction of the price. And my listeners can get started now at dollarshaveclub.com slash burr. And hey, if you're already a member, member, you got to go check out Dr. Kavi's post-shave lotion. It's the perfect way to make peace with your face after the disruptive act of shaving. Stop getting ripped off by the big shave companies. Join dollarshaveclub.com slash burr. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash burr. All right, the next one, stamps.com. Quick, convenient, and most importantly, easy to use. That's how I would describe stamps.com. It will make your mailing and shipping an absolute breeze. With stamps.com, you can buy and print official U.S. postage using your computer and your printer. There's nothing to learn. That's why I like it, because I'm an idiot. Stamps.com will give you a digital scale. It it automatically calculates exact postage for any letter, any package. They'll even help you choose the best class of mail to get your mail there on time for the least amount of money. Then drop your mail into any mailbox or hand it to your mailman, and that's it. You're done. You'll never have to go to the post office again. Trust me. Mailing and shipping has never been easier. I use Stamps.com to send out all my posters, my T-shirts, DVDs, whatever the hell I'm selling at the end of the week. And if I can figure it out, so can you. Right now, use my last name, Burr, B-U-R-R, for this special offer, no risk trial, plus a $110 bonus offer that includes a digital scale and up to $55 free postage. Don't wait. Go to Stamps.com right now before you do anything else. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Burr, B-U-R-R, that's Stamps.com, enter Burr. All right, last one, last one. Here we go. Legal Zoom, everyone. Most Americans don't have a will, but why is that? You don't want the court dictating what happens to your property and your minor children, do you? 
course you don't. So why procrastinate? Most people say, well, it's too expensive or it's too time consuming, blah, 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 blah. I got an answer for you. LegalZoom.com. Too expensive? LegalZoom prices just make sense. Too time consuming? It just takes 20 minutes. And LegalZoom can guide you through from start to finish. The service was developed by some of the best legal minds in the country, and they make it painless for you to get the legal help you need. In fact, helping people get legally protected has been their mission for the past 13 years. During the national Make-A-Will Month, get special pricings on wills and living trusts by entering Burr, B-U-R-R, in the referral box at checkout. Again, that discount code is Burr, B-U-R-R. God forbid something happens to you, but do you really want to add to the pain as they're dragging the swing set out of the backyard and giving it to somebody else down the street, some banker's kid? All right? I know, that was a weird example, but somewhere in there that made sense. Anyways, it's National Make-A-Will Month, so don't wait. Protect your family, protect your future at LegalZoom.com today. LegalZoom was developed by top attorneys to provide self-help services at your specific direction, but they are not a law firm. Legal help is furnished through uh, vetted independent attorneys. LegalZoom.com, discount code BURR, B-U-R-R. Did you ever try an instrument when you were growing up? No, I didn't. I'm not musical at all. I used to draw. I wanted to be an artist. I would draw like I, I was obsessed with Kiss. So I would draw pictures of Kiss. Right. I could never draw hands. That's always the <laughs> thing. My hands were terrible. So every character. Don't you just do the three finger thing? No, I put the hands behind the back. I really would. Everyone had hands behind the back. I couldn't. I could not grasp. That's a, that's what makes an artist. If you can draw hands, you could probably draw anything in the world. Hands and impossibility. Really? Try drawing someone's hand. It's fucking hard. I think the face is hard. Yeah, it can be, but I, I can I could work out a face. I could do. I would. It would be a little off. You know what I mean? Like it was. It was like Rocky Dennis ish sometimes. But at least it was a face. <laughs> a little bell palsy. Yeah, yeah. It was all right. Yeah. I always when I when I tried drawing, I just I just remember was everybody was always jacked. Whoever I like, the one body type I could draw would be like fucking jacked, and everybody had the same goddamn nose. But uh, I don't know. I, there's actually a show out here that I'm doing coming up. Where uh, there's a live band and it's, you know, I want to do the show. It's fucking cool where it's like you go out and you just sort of riff about music and that type of thing. And then when uh, when when you're done with your set, you then go and jam with the band however you want to do it. You can sing a song and they'll learn the song beforehand or whatever instrument you play. Is that your idea or someone's No, no, no. This is uh, somebody else's idea. I hope, I hope I didn't say that now everybody's going to steal the idea, but it's fucking f- – I'm, I'm – Gonna be doing it coming up, man. It's gonna be fun as shit, though. Well, you have balls to do that. That would scare me. Uh, yeah, but what I've learned is, I don't mean yeah, like I got balls. What I've learned is that there, there comes a point when you get something down. Anywhere in life, you got your gig down. If you don't keep learning, you don't keep pushing yourself to try to be like, all right, whatever I'm doing, how do I get better at this? I always equate it to like, I don't know, basketball or some reason, even though I don't fucking play it. But like, you know, oh, he always goes to his right. Then you got to learn to go to your left. He sucks on defense. I got to get better at defense. It's like a whole thing. Like I read this whole, they had this great magazine out about Jordan, how he just kept working and working and working and working and working. And in like, you can literally read the article and not be a Jordan, but just apply that. Right. And work and work and work and work. So for me, um, I'm really comfortable being a stand-up, but I'm not comfortable playing drums necessarily out in public or whatever. So over the years, when every time I get a chance to sit in, I would sit in and just go through, you know, it's just like you go back to being an open micro. I think there's like an ego thing that's involved that once you're good at something and people know you're good – you're, you're embarrassed to kind of stink at something a little right. bit. Sure. So you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't, and it, it takes like, I don't know. It, there's a, there's, it's a balance of the balls to try it and then also still be fucking around to be like, listen, guys, I know I'm not a professional drummer or whatever. So We can handle um, bombing on something like that because as comics, you kind of learn, all right, like I know how to be funny if I'm sucking at something or I know how to own it. Right. Like if you own something so completely, people kind of like, all right, well, what are you going to? Right, you know, he's owning that he's not a good drummer or singer. So yeah, we if you, if you go out, yeah, if I, you go out there and you, you just you're acting like a fucking idiot and you're having a good time, then they don't have to worry. Like, like I just don't want the crowd at any moment to have that thing. Like, oh wait, is he like serious here? Does he right. like feel like he should be in a band? I don't. Okay, for, any, <laughs> for anybody concerned. I do not. You're a good actor, though, man. You're a really good actor. I, oh, I, thank I finally, you. I finally went through Breaking Bad, and we had interviewed everyone on that show, and I'd never seen it. Mm-hmm. We had Cranston, we had fucking uh, 
the guy who played Hank. We had the, the, the Skyler, everyone. And then I finally watched it. And you're so good. It, you didn't take me out of it. Like, and I know you so well. And whenever you see like a close friend in something. Right. And man, I was like, fuck, that's Bill. And then right into the character. It was really fucking oh, good though. Oh, thank you. I didn't think I'd seen you since I finally watched Breaking Bad. I, I'll, I'm learning to take compliments. But I yeah. will say that show, the way it was done, all you had to do is memorize what they say and hit your marks. And they handled the rest, dude. They just – it was uh, – I don't know how to equate it. Pick a great fucking sports team, and you're coming off the bench. It's like somehow you're going to end up wearing a ring, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be one of those guys, that awful white guy dancing that Shaq used to make fun of whenever the Lakers would win it. Like, that's who I was, <laughs> who I was on Break of Bad. But it was, uh, it was fun, and, and – um, you know what scene are you most Vin- nervous doing? Were you? Because I, I remember the first time I saw you with Cranston. Uh, you, I think, were you in a car? The no, first- the first time I, I had a scene with him, I was so excited because, uh, dude, I was a fan of that show from the very beginning. Oh, okay. From the pilot episode, so I was so invested in the show, and and couldn't wait for the next season. So to all of a sudden be on it, interacting with these fucking characters, right. it was. It was like you got sucked into your TV and then fast forwarded into time. Right. So there was this. It, it, I, I always said I felt like I won a radio contest or something. Like you know, do you want to play a stormtrooper in the next <laughs> Star Wars and stand next to Darth Vader? I always felt that when I was there, and I would have been happy just getting one of them. And the fact that they kept bringing me back, and the fact that you know uh, Vince Gilligan used so many stand-up comics to get back to your thing. When when uh, the question, did it, the, the first scene I did with Cranston was uh, was after. I'm trying not to to ruin it for anybody because everybody, you know. Spoil- oh, yeah, people, I've seen it. Right, right. You know, spoiler alert. When does that run out? You know. I know. But um, we had shaken down this guy for money, and he got hurt. So we had to go talk to the lawyer, Saul Goodman. So it was me and Lavelle Crawford. Oh, he, that was, he played Hugh. I didn't realize that was Lavelle Crawford. Like, I, I he know was his fucking name. unreal on yes, this show. Yes, he was good. I didn't realize he was a comedian too. That's right. So we had this little bit that we were doing at the top, this whole act of God thing. And then Brian Cranston ca- character bursts in. So our thing was we jump up and sort of make sure that he's not coming for Saul. And then Saul tells us to screw. And I was so excited that I was actually going to be in a scene sure. with Mr. White. Because Mr. White, to me, it took everybody i don't know how long like three four seasons for the entire country but for diehards like myself like he was you know I, i've never had a guy like a character that i followed that i was rooting for so hard and then all of a sudden he took this fucking turn he took this turn where I'm, i, I kind of felt weird about rooting for him and then i was just started watching going like dude what are you doing just turn yourself in. Just stop. Blah blah right. blah. And it was it was like literally watching, literally watching like someone you loved, like you knew, like a family member rooting him on and being making excuses for him. And yeah, what's he supposed to do? The guy he's sick. He, yeah. They're not giving him any fuck. He put his time in. You know that type of shit. And then somewhere, you know, it, you know, it, I don't know. After how many fucking murders and just some of the shit that he started doing to Jesse, that it started to it started to turn, and it was. It just was unreal to be, you know, I've lucked out. I've really lucked out where I've gotten to be a part, very small part of some, some pretty amazing things. Cause my IMDP page is, is a pretty quick read, but, um, I got to tell you, I like, I've always liked the shit you've done. Like the stuff you did in, uh, Spider-Man. I wish, I wish I could have seen that whole fucking rant you did, even though I just, you know, I don't like him and he stinks, but you, you were really in it and they had you in the back of that truck. You just look like this New York guy who was dropping off something. And you were fucking pissed. I know you're going to shit on your acting, but I loved it. No, 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 no. But I'm going to point out this is why Bill's a good friend. And this is why I love Bill. Because honestly, you, you had a part in what is tremendous. Like, uh, it's one of the culturally biggest events. How bad would Keith be trashing us right now for, for rubbing each other's balls? So, but we're being nice. We're friends. <laughs> Keith, Keith's problem is Keith doesn't know how to be nice about anything. Oh, but I remind me to tell you about Keith. And he came in with that fucking – he came in with a Dave Chappelle sh- shirt. Uh, the other night from his Chappelle. Oh, no. He's wearing a Chappelle at uh, Radio City, and me and Colin are at the table. And we're like, oh, you fucking fat fanboy. And we just attacked him. <laughs> and he sat down for five minutes, and he goes, I'm going to change the shirt. And he got up, and he left the comedy cellar, and he came back with a button down shirt over. And that's the second time in my life I've been able to chase him out. I remember one time he ran out. 
with his shirt. I was there that night. I forget what. He ran out. That puffy white, awful. Looked like, it looked like uh, a, a betting shirt that he had on, and I beat him so terribly. He, he and he, and he, he hung in there for like two rounds, <laughs> three rounds, and then it was just, and then he stood up and ran out. And I remember being pissed, being like, you can fucking do that? I didn't know you could leave. Yeah. I never thought to leave. Like that pounding I took, the bus <laughs> pounding. Which is one of the all-time class. You guys literally did a headlining set. You did 45 minutes on me when I was going to do... Uh, yeah, oh, Diamond fuck. Backs. That was it. That was it. We were both going to do it. No, no. Esty... Esty... Whatever the fuck it was. Esty... Somebody approached the Comedy Cell of these Atlanta Brave fans. And they said... Oh, uh, right, right. It was, was it the Diamondbacks or no? No, it was the Braves. Okay. And they said, you know, they were taking a bus from Manhattan up to Yankee Stadium, and they wanted to hire a comic for the bus ride up. And at the end of it, they were going to give you a World Series ticket. So we sat there going, oh, man, that's going to be brutal. I don't know, blah, 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 all of that type of shit. And um, I forget what happened at the last, without me knowing, you said, you know what, I'm not fucking doing that. That's bullshit, <laughs> right? And I didn't know it, so I agreed to do it. And then... We sat down and we started trashing each other. And this is this is what you started it. I fucking I go. I vaguely remember that. I said this to you. I made fun of your shirt, but blah, blah, blah. And I was getting you and everyone was <laughs> laughing. And you know that thing at the table. You're like, oh, my God, I'm winning. I'm winning. I'm finally winning here. And then as they're all laughing, you just lean in. You go, whatever, bus boy. And the whole table stopped and went, what? And you said, Bill Burr is going to do stand up on a bus on the way to the roof. And all fucking chairs turned at me. That's the funny. And dude, all the killers were there. You, Patrice, Voss, Kevin, Kevin Hart. There, yeah. Kevin Hart was there. Keith was there. 45 minutes. I didn't say a word and just got pounded. And then, and I was still going to do the gig. Because to me, that was an easy gig. Sure. All I had to do was shit on the Yankees the whole way, make fun of fucking New York, and say that Atlanta was better, say that I was a Red Sox fan. I would have been fucking shotgunning beers with them. It would have yeah. been a joke. But I ended up not doing the gig, which a lot of people don't know. I didn't do the gig because Patrice, in the end of it, dude, you guys were trashing me so bad, like strangers were either laughing or they were going, oh, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the great ones. Patrice imitating me. Oh, Patrice goes, hey, when they call you out on stage, he goes, are you going to come out of the bathroom or are you going to walk up those little steps? <laughs> I, I remember all of them. He had another one where he was he was imitating me at the end of the show. And this is a visual, so I'll have to explain it. I finish. I'm in the front front of the bus. I go, hey, thanks a lot. You guys are great. And then he imitates me turning around, sitting down. And then as people are walking by, reaching over my show, good show, good show. I go, hey, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Reaching over my shoulder. Uh, they asked You guys asked if I was going to use the, the, the bus driver's microphone to do the show. <laughs> I was going to bring my own. Dude, every joke was just funnier than the next one, and it was never-ending. I took this fucking brutal pounding, but I was still going to do it. I was like, fuck these guys. I'm a sports fan. I want to go to the game. I don't give a fuck. So in the end, you guys had all left, and it was just me and Patrice sitting there, and he just goes, Bill, he goes, you're making enough money at this point. If you want, if you want to go to the game, buy a fucking ticket, all right? He goes, dude, I will – he called me the N-word. He said, N-word? He goes, I will stand in front of that bus so you don't do that gig. Do not do that fucking gig. And it was the first time I ever thought of like, you know, like self-esteem. Yeah. Like why not just blow the cash and actually have a little dignity? Because you just come into this business doing like those Jersey Turnpike yeah. gigs and all that shit that you don't – you just feel like I need to learn how to do this. So I didn't do the gig. And I actually passed the gig off to somebody else. And I t had taken such a bad pounding. I said, listen, I'll never tell anybody. I'll never tell anybody who I gave this gig to. And I think the person who did it, didn't they come in and say who it was? I believe they I'll tell you did. when we're done because, I, I mean, it doesn't matter now. Oh, no, it's funny. It doesn't they, matter they now. Would... But I, I, I don't think he would care. No. I passed it on. Not at all. No, um, would feel bad. That's a that's a many many years ago, and he'd probably be love to be associated. I asked him what it was like, and he he told me later. I go, what was it like? He goes, oh, dude. He goes, it was brutal. Yeah, it was brutal. He goes, but the second it was over, and I had that World Series ticket, dude. He ran away from those people, and it's hilarious. It was their ticket, so then you just sort of sat next to them, so he kind of couldn't leave them. But uh, 
I'll never forget that. That was that was another turning point that I learned from someone who I started with was to have self-esteem. Like at some point you can say no. Like I'm not, you know what? I'm I'm making enough money here in the city. It wasn't I was making great money, but I was making enough money that if I wanted to blow, I mean, how much was a World Series ticket? Four or five hundred bucks back then. Yeah, Yeah, to sit in the upper deck, to not stand on a bus, you fucking moron, and humiliate yourself. (laughs) So. You know what those gigs teach you too, like like the, the seller, is getting pounded so terribly. Like, I get beaten so badly sometimes. Like, you know, Bobby or Keith and Colin, and you know when they're all attacking you. There's times where I'm, I'm a comedian for over 20 years, and I find myself still answering seriously. Like when they're killing me, I'm like, well, no, that's not exactly what happened. Like <laughs> I'm getting beaten up so bad, and I know I'm helpless. I'm fucking. I'm turning into like my girlfriend when I'm annoyed. Like you know, that's not accurate at all. It's so. <laughs> It's cleansing, though, to get a beating like that. It's, it's like there's a You know, one of my favorite ones watching you taking a beating was that time when you were on a date and Patrice was yelling over at you and you weren't talking back to him. Oh, my God. And he started – and you and you had just started yeah. opening for Dice That's and you were thrilled, your hero, and you guys were hanging out and Patrice started imitating <laughs> Dice talking to you in the character during the day and you were sitting in the corner trying to ignore him and Patrice was all the way across the restaurant and he's going – Hey, Jim, let's go to the mall. Oh! And we were all fucking crying, laughing. And you finally had to give into it, man. Like, those are the things, what I loved about it. And, like, I love watching your date kind of keep hearing the name Jim and hearing us laughing and slowly figuring out, like, is he talking about you and you trying to stay in the date for an excruciating five minutes, dude? Fuck, I miss that guy, man. I, I remember one time I was uh, – I would, I would always come in off the road and not sleep. We would, I would be done with usually dice on Saturday night. So Sunday morning, I'd fly home with no sleep. And I wasn't doing radio in, at that time. So right. Sunday nights, I'd be loopy and go on at the cellar on no sleep. And I always had good sets because I'd be creative because I'd be overtired. And I would come in. We played chess every night there. I would play with Keith. I remember. Patrice you were good play. too, man. I, I, in, I in, stunk. In our little circle, yeah. But I mean, compared to a real chess player, I'm a fucking, I'm a chimp. But I mean, you know, in our little, the me, you, Bobby. Yeah, but you were like reading the Bobby Fisher book. You were into it, dude. Yeah, yeah, I do enjoy him. Um, <laughs> he's I'm, quite a character. I was getting, I remember I was, because Keith was such a shit talker. Like, he's like a, he's like one of those fucking bums in the park. Like, those, they're like master level players because they're all homeless and they play for drinks and they play yeah. for food. So they're real players. But Keith, you know, you'd, you'd move your queen. He'd do that stupid up. thing with his fingers, yeah, like, like he was lit, sprinkling salt. Like he's sprinkling salt. He'd pick up, ah, let's see what color panties she did. And I would, like, literally be <laughs> non-comedian guy. Quit touching my fucking piece, man. And, uh, oh, you gotta, you got to re-explain that to the listeners. Keith, what Keith Robinson would do when he knew he was closing in on your queen, he would reach over and pick it up and be like, ah, what color panties is she wearing? And set it down. Like, he was just touching your talking pieces. Talking tra- Oh, yeah, it was annoying as shit. And I remember one time Patrice pulled my chair out after I had lost. I had lost and I was so fucking overtired and cranky and uh, he wanted to play Keith so he had winners and I lost and he was, it was just such a dismissive pull my chair out and move me and I, <laughs> with I remember, you still sitting in it I was of course I was oh. yeah. and he just dragged me out and I was so mad I went don't touch my chair like I'm fucking a grown man and that's my comeback <laughs> don't touch my chair like oh and how long did you get pounded for that I was just an awful night and that was a bad night I was overtired and I sucked and yeah that was You brutal. know what was the worst was the carryover the carryover trashing where there was so much le- meat left over on the bone. Yeah. You'd come back the next night and, hey, the fucking chair guy. <laughs> Sit down, dude. Don't touch his chair. You're like, oh. Sometimes I think about those days and I was just like, it's, it's fucking hilarious and it's a goddamn tragedy. that We never sat down and wrote anything. All we, we took all of our comedic skills and just used them to humiliate each other. Yeah. We just sat there. But. It all worked out, doesn't it? it those, I guess those, so. Those moments made, <laughs> I think, made every one of us a better comic, a thicker skin comic, because then you're on stage in front of ten thousand people and, and getting an unfair booing. That was when we first started on K Rock, right. and you had been not the XM listeners loved you, but they, the K Rock listeners didn't know you as well at that point because it was a new thing and you had been away, and they're booing you, and you pull out this fucking one of the great moments of stand-up that I've ever witnessed, which was just turning 10,000 Philadelphia fucking monsters. And they're the worst crowds in the world if they don't like you. And you turned them. You did the impossible. And that's, that, that's like... Well, that's I, l- I lucked out the that. sports thing. There was enough 
Jersey and New York sports fans, you know, the Patrick division and, and uh, whatever, the ML, the National League East yeah. or whatever. There's enough Mets fans that hated the Phillies. There's enough fucking fans that everybody hates the fucking Flyers, you know, except for Philly fans. So I was able to do that. But what was funny was I actually, when I finished that set, I felt bad because you had to go on next. And I was like, oh, God, you know, when a comic burns down yeah. the room. And that was basically, that was not a, like, you can burn down the room, I feel, as the headliner. But to burn down the room when there's another guy going up on basically a showcase night, I was sitting there. I thought you were going to be mad at me. And Not I was, and, and you went out, never addressed what just happened, went right into your act and fucking smashed him. Yeah, I mean, again, they knew me, though. It was like the, 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 the terrestrial crowd knew me. So I had to, you know, it was kind of like, you know, they were expecting me to come out. But uh, I felt uh, you know, if that if that show had occurred six months after that, right. when that crowd knew you, that never would have happened. That, that was just – that was a really weird transition time. But what you did with that crowd – I mean, yeah, it was the sports knowledge. But it, it was about uh, the ability to pull that out in front of all those people because it took a while. They didn't just start laughing. Well, you know what? I had been booed before. A couple, I got booed uh, on a Vegas show I, and, and I didn't leave but I didn't know – the first time you get booed, dude, is fucking unreal. It's like – it's the weirdest experience because you have exactly what you want, the, to- the total focus of the crowd, but the exact opposite emotion. Right. I've always compared it to like, you know, when they do the reverse echoes on those Zeppelin things to make it seem like you're in hell. Like the echo comes first before your voice. That's like sort of the stand up version of that where it's like they're cheering, but they're booing. It's the most fucked up thing. And, and I remember after getting booed, um, just fucking walking through the hotel, going back to my room, and, st- and I started thinking about people in the crowd. And it's like, all right, Bill, you got booed, but you let that guy boo you? You let that woman with that awful dress, that guy with the big head? You could have at least said that. It was just so shocking the first time it happened. And also, I, uh, you know, I did a lot of those, uh, the uptown rooms, as they called them, the black oh, rooms. black crowds, yeah. yeah. So you kind of had to get, you know, I was in fighting shape. So it somehow, uh, I just remember Opie coming through the the curtain opie and and i think he had his glass of red wine and opie just came walking through and was just like he said he goes that was one for the ages bro and just came walking out and what was funny was you went out and killed and the second that was done that was the end of the show and then they brought me back out for the curtain call and i got booed again half clapping half booing and i remember there was this dude who ran up to the stage he was going bill burry screaming he's going fuck you fuck you and i'm going what and he's he's giving me the finger he's going fuck you fuck you and i kept going what it's like uh, you're giving me the finger how do i not know i just kept going i i I can't you i literally got him hopping mad he was jumping up and down screaming giving me the finger i just kept going i I can't and i kept cupping my ear like i can't hear you and the guy went fuck you fuck you and it just i just laughed at him and uh that was yeah that was the end of it and uh I remember I, I I rode back with Bobby Kelly, and um, I had a fucking splitting headache after it. And uh, I just remember riding back with Bobby, and and he was just laughing, going, "Dude, do you realize you just told ten thousand people to go fuck themselves?" And I was dreading it because I was like, "Fuck, I know somebody filmed that." Because I thought when it got on the internet. I knew comics would appreciate it, but I didn't know that – I didn't know fans would get it if, right. they, if they would just be like, oh, you got booed. You sucked. You know, fuck this guy. Ha ha. Everybody laughing at you and shit because, you know, can kind of go – can kind of go either way. But uh, whatever. I, I, we're here for you here. No, 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 no. Hey, that, that to me was uh, – that was a fascinating thing to watch because it was legitimately funny stuff. It wasn't like you were obnoxious and got the crowd. Like you were really – pounding them like a comic like that's what was so fun about it. if you had just taken your pants off and waved your cock at them and uh, like all right any idiot could well, you, still fucking hilarious though but you, it would be, that would have been much better obviously <laughs> but i mean that would, that, that was still, that would have been like instant legend but the fact that you got them as a comic, I, I, saw, I saw a guy do that did you i'm not gonna say because i don't want to get him in trouble sure. but i saw uh when i was doing late nights at the cellar do you remember how they used to have that water pipe they used to hang sure. just and this guy used to go up he's a fucking madman and he used to fucking hang from that pipe by one arm and he had this crazy look on his face he looked like charles manson i'm trying to let you know who this guy yeah. was right so he went on stage and he's doing his fucking thing and like really just one of these great comics where like just 
the pain of whatever he went through is yeah. right there on the surface. So if anybody moves, he's going to cut their head off. So there was some woman who was all fucking dressed up or something sitting, you know, she's in her fifties and she's not laughing. And he just keeps looking at her and he just finally just starts going like, isn't that right, mom? Huh? Mom, mommy. And he got in her face and he finally just goes, mom, and screamed in her face. And she got like mad. And she goes, uh, I, she started giving him shit. And he said, like, lady, if you don't, he got to the point, he's like, lady, if you don't shut up, I'm going to take my dick out and slap you in the face with it. And she goes, you don't have the balls. And he goes, oh, I don't have the balls. And he starts unzipping his pants. The crowd is going fucking nuts because they think he's joking. And he fucking pulled his dick out. Pull his dick out. <laughs> and he, he had it by the shaft and just his fucking purple head is coming out. And he made these machine gun noises and went <laughs> like right in her face, dude. The fucking place went ballistic. Fucking ballistic. And he ended his set there. I hope so, yeah. And Wanda, who was hosting at the time, up and coming, Wanda Sykes, I think she was the host, fucking outroed him and then brought me up was it wanda wanda hosted one of the fucked up ones i can't remember so brings me up and i had to go on after him and i was still new to new york and i was i was already gonna bomb and he took his dick out and shook it in this fucking woman's face and dude i can't even tell you how hard i ate it and i was too green i didn't know to be like just riff about the guy yeah how taking his dick. That dude, was. i went up and tried to do my act I went up and I immediately went up and like, gee, it's been raining a lot here in New York City. It just, it, it just completely flatlines. Yeah, so. it's like walking into a party and not acknowledging what's just been happening. Yeah, it was awful. Yeah, yeah, I think I know who you mean, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there you go. <laughs> well, listen, we're, uh, we're a little over an hour oh, here, dude. I, I can't tell you how excited I am. Thank you, Bill. To, to see it. And once again, uh, promoted, it's going to be this Wednesday. July 23rd is the uh, premiere episode with uh, Dana White and Mike Tyson are my guests. And uh, I, I think people will like it. I'm actually really ha happy with it, which is rare. Dude, I'm, I'm as excited to see the monologue as I am just to see a guy like you. Because I always wondered. I always wondered, like, you know, you ever be, like, doing a bit and you're just thinking, that would be a great monologue, Joe, because it's topical. Like, say, your, your, your Clippers guy stuff. You know, which I haven't seen, which I know is going to be fucking great. But, like, uh, I, I can't imagine, like, seeing that kind of thing rather than just being, like, the safe right. sort of, uh, looks like there's going to be two empty seats courtside yeah. come tonight in the Clippers. Right. I mean, some of the some of the models is like, dude, are you even fucking trying? Um, anyways, that's the special uh, podcast here with Jim Norton. Dude, I'm glad I finally Thank was you, able bro. to get you on this. I appreciate and, it, man. Uh, I'll see you up in Montreal. Oh. I'm going to try to drag my uh, hungover ass out of bed. And come down and do the uh, the, oh, right. the now Opie and Jimmy show. Yes, oh, yeah, I'm doing the keynote speech too, so it should be a real gentleman's affair. And oh, you I, are. I know you're getting the uh, the award uh, this year for uh, comic of the year for, for hanging things. in there long no, enough it's to great. get you one. Deserve it, man. You've had a great year, and it, it's it's a deserved thing. If I see a comic where I don't like getting shit like that, I'm not just saying that because you're my friend. You're a great uh -huh. comic, and when you see a guy you admire, you know, it's like it, 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 the thing is, people are like oh, I don't suck each other's dicks, but it's like I don't get to tell my friends. Like, you know what I mean? Like, hey, man, I love what you – you don't get to tell your friends that. We're just – we're used to each other. All right. You know what I'm saying? I just I like sometimes. doing festivals because I finally get to see you guys because once we all start – we all moved up the same time. Yeah. You know, hosting, featuring, and right. then, then headlining. So you never got to work on the road with each right. other. But when we were all doing spots in the city, you could kind of watch. That was another thing. Remember when we used to go downstairs when someone would be on stage and you just stare at him? Kevin Hart. Yeah, and, and try to take yes. the confidence. And, and Kevin, Kevin didn't back down. Nope, he Had, took it. Yeah, and he was very new too. He, we would walk down, me, you, Patrice, Keith, Bobby, whoever else was around, just sit in the – because the cellar was half empty back then – and sit in the front rows ugh, ugh, and, and, or laugh obnoxiously loud at his awful jokes. Uh, when he was – you know, I'm a little – you know, his little fucking what, short what, guy What about jokes. when Florentine would start groans? Oh, my God. Those are the greatest skills I've ever – he would sit in the back oh. – he would sit in the back of, of the crowd and he would turn the crowd on you by like groaning. He could almost like throw his voice yeah. like, oh, oh Jesus. Oh, come on. Oh, yeah, come on. And then like it was contagious. And then there'd be like three people, ah, oh, and he, <laughs> he would just get it going. We ruined Voss's night one night at Caroline's because the curtain was drawn. It was a Sunday night. Jim's on one side of the curtain and I'm on the other. And just doing the – it was like groans in stereo. Like, oh, man. And it was Florentine's we wanted to conceptualize that. And I'll never forget Voss for 45 minutes on stage just being combative with you. Like, what the fuck do you guys want from me? You know how like fucking ornery he is. Fucking dope. So, yeah. Florentine's Why did we do that to each other? 
It's fun. Why didn't we support? I'm just. We never. Never support each other. We, I remember Voss and Patrice got into some huge fight down in Caroline's because he, he was actually opening for Patrice. And Patrice trashed his CD so bad, <laughs> he brought it up on stage and he ripped it in half and like, ripped the cover in half and then broke it. And, <laughs> and he was trashing it so bad and the crowd laughed so hard that Voss got mad for real. And it was one of the, you know, we've had, we've had a zillion real arguments and then two days later, you don't give a fuck. And it was just like, why would you do that? Me and Patrice had a real argument when we were doing the Colin Quinn show on NBC. I was trying to get something through standards and practices. Uh-huh. And, you know, he was just being Patrice. Rah, rah. He just gave me a hard time with this woman. And I'm like, fucking dude, <laughs> shut up. Like, you know, and we st- I'm, I'm like, you know, you know, I know you're a comedian. You don't have to prove it. I'm fucking doing it. This is work. You know, I was trying to get like literally a piece of material through. And we had like a real argument over it. And Keith had to fucking play, you know. The uh, the arbiter. Yeah, yeah. Once oh no, Patrice. Could, dude, I had a real fucking. I had a one that became a classic because of the fucking internet. I had that huge one with him over the stupid fucking man cow show um, oh. on your show on the Opie and Anthony show. We like Patrice called up, told his man cow thing, trashed me, and then I called up Monday to defend myself. And of course, somebody on the show put fucking Patrice on hold. He just put the two dogs in the ring. You know, I vaguely remember. I don't even know. If oh, I dude, know. it was a fucking like we were pissed at each other for like, you know what? It was funny. What, what broke the ice, I think, was that uh, was that Philly rant. The Philly rant. We finally started talking to each other. We hadn't talked in like, you know, three, four months, which wasn't hard because we weren't seeing each other too much. But we were right. kind of just pissed. And um, when if you watch the Philly rant, there's a time where I look over the, the, the DJ going, dude, why are you yelling out shit? You're fucking me up. I vaguely remember doing that. But what it actually was was Patrice was trying to help me. He yelled out Invincible, which would have been a great one to bring up about Philly, which was about a guy who was playing it, was working in a bar, tries out for the Eagles. Not only does he get a tryout, he makes the fucking team and has an impact. Like, I could have just gone off on how bad the Eagles sucked. Um, and I, I, he, he, you know, he threw that out there. Like, got past our stupid acting like a couple bitches not talking to each other, saw me in trouble and fucking yeah. threw that out there. And then when I came off stage, he just started talking like, you know, one of the few times he ever threw me a compliment. Right. Um, and then, you know, then we were cool after that. It was just like a fucking, I don't know. Ah, Jesus Christ. Whatever. We got a lot of stories at this point. You yeah. Know? It's nice, though. I like it, though. I, I like, uh, you know, like musicians. I hear musicians talk. And I'm like, that must have been fun to be a part of that. But then I realized, like, hey, I'm a part of a pretty cool group of people, just comedians who I like. And it's like I, I never get to watch. I don't watch David Tell. I don't watch you if you're on. I don't want to watch stand-up. Like, Did you see a Tell's latest special? Did no. you see it? Oh, my God. Was I it won't great. watch it. I love oh. Dave. We were doing co-headlining gigs, and he would walk on stage literally like a fucking like a gnome. He's carrying a plastic bag with things in them. It's like he's losing his mind. And every <laughs> once in a while, because I, I would always make him go on last. And I'm like, look, dude, I'll take less money. I don't think That's the antisocial. Uh, no, um, this was just me and Dave doing oh, a couple okay. together. Okay. And, uh, Jesus, what a fucking show. It was a good show, but then we would riff at the end. Like I would come on stage with him, and we would just do like 15 or 20 minutes playing with the audience, and that was fun. That was you were awesome part. at that, yeah. We okay. had a good time, and he's great. But watching him, like even for the couple of minutes when I came back, he would always throw out one or two that would just make me fucking hate being a comedian. Like, God damn. I'll never – he just did one dumb line. Like, you ever been on mushrooms or, 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 and you, or you're so high and you think you're having a pillow fight but then you realize you're holding a live baby? <laughs> 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 and I'm like, I just wish I thought of that. That's Dude, just- he had one – I, I, I don't remember how we set it up but the Olympics were going on and somebody doing the luge had died that day. And and he went on stage and said something to the effect that I think I think it's very fitting that the Olympics started with the sacrifice. I can't even do how he did it, but he did it. You know when he talks like low, yeah. and he just sort of vaguely threw it out there, and just to see if the crowd even got it. And it was just like, oh my god, that's so fucking. And so it was such a smart joke, going back to the original Olympics and like that time where I don't know they had sac. I don't even fucking know. It, it's just yeah, he's one of those. Guys. He, but he's a guy that I will watch because there's. There's him and Harlan Williams are two guys. The way they do their shit, it's just like there's no way I'm going right. to – there's going to be no overlap the way – like Harlan, when he just comes up, hey, what do you say there, pig in a blanket? What are you, what are you doing there, buddy? Huh? Right. What are you doing there, sport? And he just kind of goes off on these crazy 
I don't even know what he's doing. Absolutely fucking destroys. That last time I worked with Harlan, I said that to him. I go, nobody in your career has ever walked up to you going, hey, Harlan, I kind of have a – kind of yeah. got a joke like that, you know? So anyways, I got my dog downstairs. Okay, I got to I gotta go uh, – Thank go, you for go coming. Get her. Yeah, man. Um, um, you're so funny. You're so used to doing the fucking show. You said thank you for coming. Oh, actually, I did come over to your hotel room. You did, yeah, I thought yeah, it was yeah. like Okay, well. I appreciate it. Dude, thank you for coming on the podcast. I'm glad we were able to uh, to finally – Knock one of these out, and yeah. uh, like he said, uh, Wednesday, July twenty third. What's the What's the website? Vice dot com. It'll be easy to find. Vice dot com. Check out Jim Norton's new show called The Jim Norton Show. The Jim Norton. Oh, Jesus, that's clever. Thanks, Bill. All right, go fuck yourselves. I'll see you on Monday.